Hi everyone, uh, I am Hao Ni from the Mathematical Department of the UCL. Let me introduce Alex Watson, who is a faculty uh, member from the Statistical Department at UCL. We are the organizer of the ISS and DataSig workshop on the rapid path theory in machine learning. Welcome you uh, to our workshop. Thank you very much for your participation. Due to COVID-19 pandemics, we have to move our workshop online. Thanks to the technology advancement, we are still connected despite the physical distance. In fact, all the speakers are located in different countries, but sharing their research with us today, our audience might come from even more broadly all over the world. The COVID pandemics echoed and amplified the impact of the technology and science. In this unprecedented reality, we are also witnessing the beginning of the drastic change in every aspect of our lives. It highlights the importance of embracing the change and uncertainty by finding constructive way out and establishing the new normal, which may apply to science too. Raw path theory has been an active and growing research area since it was first developed developed by Professor Terry Lines, our first speaker, in 1990s. It emerged as an improved approach to dealing with the interaction of the complex random system as a branch of stochastic analysis. Recently, it underpins Martin Hess Fields' meta-winning work on the regularity structures, but the applications to data science are advancing too. This workshop will showcase the latest development in this direction. Besides, this workshop aims to facilitate the conversation and the exchange of the new ideas across disciplines and the communities. Therefore, your active uh, engagement is essential to the success of our workshop. Please feel free to type your uh, questions and comments regarding the presentation and the panel discussion to the chat box. We will select as many questions as possible to pass them to the speakers. I hope that all of you will have an enjoyable experience uh, at our workshop. Lastly, I will mention several things about logistics. To ensure the quiet environment for the presentations, I would like to ask all of you to mute your microphone and switch off the camera during the presentation time. And we, uh, uh, this event is uh, videotaped. If you have any concerns uh, about the video recording, please feel free to contact us by email. Okay, so now is uh, the time to start. Let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Terry Lines. It's our great honor to have Terry here. Um, Terry is the Wallace Professor of Mathematics at University of Oxford, and he is currently the principal investigator of the DataSec program, primarily uh, funded by the EPSRC. DataSec is a uh, a product that bridges from the fundamental mathematics to application contexts, for example, mental health, action recognition, and so on. Terry's long-term research interests are all focused on the rapid path stochastic analysis and the applications, particularly to finance and more generally to summarizing of the large complex data. And uh, let's welcome uh, Terry. Um, Terry, would you like to share your slides? Yeah, 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 I will. Um, I've just got to find the right bit. That should work. Can you see them? Yeah. OK, uh, well, thanks very much, everybody, for coming along and for showing interest in this. And thanks very much to Hal for her efforts in putting it together and the Royal Statistical Society. We very much appreciate that. And we hope, as Hal says, that it will be an interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to focus my talk at a relatively high level. I don't want to get involved in too much technicality, but nor do I want to hide the fact 
that there is real mathematics here. <clears throat> so it's something of a compromise, and I hope that we succeed. Um, Rough Path Theory started, as Hal said, as a way of understanding and making mathematically precise the interaction between complex evolving systems, multidimensional systems, and how should you do that in a way that's capable of dealing with things like Brownian motion and, and things that are much worse than that. And in doing so, it develops some certain tools. And those tools have turned out, perhaps naturally, when you really understand what they do, uh, to offer some new tools in data science. Later on, you'll hear from Cindy and people uh, all sorts of ways that these things are really being used. And I hope you'll hear some from me too. But what I can say perhaps is a little less up to date. It's more about framing the picture of how we got to where we are. Okay, so rough path theory is about understanding stream data. That is data that evolves. Importantly, it's not necessarily a time series in the way we usually think about it. In particular, it's rarely stationary. It's um, often the different dimensions are happening at very different speeds. And basically, it's complicated. Um, this, all these videos that you're watching here are really quite good examples of streams of data. Um, they're pretty high dimensional in the current form. And we'll talk about that later on. But one of the interesting questions that people in computer science are certainly interested in is how, given all these types of data, can you figure out what people are actually doing in the videos, so-called action detection? It's a major theme. We're going to touch on it, and I'm going to tell you about what we can do in it, but I don't want to, I don't want to imply that we are doing the whole of action recognition. It's a huge area with a huge number of academics doing exciting things. But these are quite interesting data set actually put together by one of our collaborators, uh, um, Cordelia Smith and others. Um, and one of the reasons it's interesting is actually videos don't come in millions and billions. So actually understanding what's happening in something ideally should look at a relatively low dimensional object because you're never going to have huge samples. Another thing about these videos is that they're very personal and we're becoming much more sensitive about that. But in general, video data actually talks about people. And that's a sensitive issue. And I'm going to try and tackle both of those and explain a little bit how rough path theory has an answer to them. So rough path theory is at, the, at its basics, it's mathematics, like arithmetic is mathematics. It has a set of tools, and we understand the set of tools. And the tools are quite complex and sophisticated, and you can start thinking about them for quite a long time. And there are plenty of open questions left in understanding them. Um, our goal today is to explain how they actually play a role in data science. Now, the first time they played a role in data science, a significant role, and actually a significant part of that came out of the school that Cindy is in, um, was in the recognition of Chinese handwriting. Chinese handwriting, as here visualized, is somebody simply somebody moving their finger over the screen of a mobile phone and sketching out the writing. It's obviously a relatively complex two-dimensional stream of data, um, maybe three if you include pressure and things like that. But it's got a lot of information in it. And it's interesting to think how you would actually understand and interpret it. Now, the first connection between rough path theory and data were happening really between Hal, myself, and Daniel Levin at the Ultraman Institute. And simultaneously, Ben Graham was doing stuff. And we were thinking in finance, and Ben Graham was thinking about convolutional neural nets and the Chinese handwriting. Now, what Ben realized, though, was that if he modified his feature set to take account of the, um, sorry, I wanted to just stop the acca. If you modify the feature set and use some of our technology, the so-called signature, as a way of describing the path better locally on a sliding window inside the convolutional neural net, you substantially improve the quality of the character recognition compared with a basic 
convolutional neural net. And he won the biannual competition for doing online handwriting using this technology. And it got taken up by the South China University of Technology and Liam Wen and his team. And um, they engineered an app that really works. Um, and it works on the iPhone, it works on the Android, and became, I think, effectively the best app. In the, we'll come back to what happened to it in the end. But then something happened is that we wanted to get in on this act. We wanted to understand better how we could turn rough path theory into a tool. And it's a slow process because you have to, first of all, learn about what other people are trying to do and so on. But one of the first things we tried to deal with, actually, were not people, but these landmarked people, these matchstick men, if you like. Now, if you look at this matchstick man, and you watch him move, you now have a path. You have a path in maybe 30 dimensional space. Um, depends on how many landmarks, how many joints you record the position of. But I think you'll agree that that path still contains a lot of useful information in it. It's also a relatively low dimensional object. <clears throat> a path in 30 dimensions is very different to a path in a few million dimensions. <clears throat> But also, from a very practical point of view, it's de-identified. I mean, it may not be perfectly de-identified, but whatever it is. But to a very large extent, you're looking at a piece of data that people don't mind sharing compared with a piece of data that people do mind sharing. And that also is quite important, I think, because recognizing human actions is something of very great value if people let you do it. I mean, it can work, for example, to monitor whether somebody's fallen down in their home. But who on earth wants a video camera pointing them at their home as they walk across the breakfast and they never bothered to get dressed and so on? And actually being able to understand what's going on without that inquisitiveness unnecessarily, I think has considerable value. So this is a path. And it's a hard problem because paths are infinite dimensional. You see a single static image is a single static image. But once the image starts moving, you start having functions with values in the space. So essentially, you've taken a leap in dimension, which is really quite a substantial one. <clears throat> so let's move on. Right, so rough path theory, as I tried to explain at the beginning, is actually the mathematics of how you describe sequence data, data that happens in an order, but not really well modeled by time series. I mean, some examples later on, I'll mention very briefly a case where we were looking at uh, brain weights to understand component brain weights to understand perhaps whether somebody's having a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And there you have to rely on scans. And sometimes you have three scans, sometimes you have seven scans, and they're not equally spaced. They're not what we really comfortably feel as time series, but they are paths, they evolve, the sequence of events. There are many, many situations where that slightly richer, broader version of stream data is really very common. We've seen the finger on the um, the finger on the uh, screen, but it could be a financial order book. It could be a piece of text. Text is quite an interesting example of a of a um, of a stream. It could be a patient res hospital record. Um, it could even be emotions evolving in time. And we've done some work there, which shows that actually they can be quite informative. Self-reported mood can be quite informative in understanding and distinguishing between different communities with various mental health diagnoses. Um, so it's a very wide ranging set of objects and it raises a lot of areas where much statistical challenge um, occurs. There's loads of missing data that's not really missing. It's just less reported in different ways. There can be missing data, but that's a separate topic. Um, things happen at very different rates for different things, and some things don't change at all during the whole interval. And how do you integrate and accommodate that? Well, it turns out in a way the signature is really rather good at doing that. Um, we're in a period of very rapid change, and anybody who tries to get involved with data science will realize this. There are thousands of people out there, literally. I mean, I think, was it 13,000 at last year's NIPS? The rate of change is huge, and it's also very driven in a particular dynamic. 
Um, it's very tempting for, I think, a data scientist to ask, well, what's left for the mathematicians to say? And certainly we're much slower. Um, and no doubt statistician will probably also ask the same things. But just to be fair, the data scientists will probably ask the same thing about the statisticians as the mathematicians. Um, well, there are things to say, and that's what I'm going to try and focus on here today. I'm going to try and explain very briefly uh, how a couple of mathematical points that I think you should be able to get hold of, which should help you understand why there is something to say. Crucially, There is something about paths that is often put in there that doesn't belong there. And that's a parameterization. Sometimes all that matters is the curve. Even time you can think of like that if you think of a curve in space time. The thing that uh, the feature sets we use manage to do is they manage to give a description of curves that's completely canonical that helps you understand well the functions on these objects and which doesn't in any way introduce a parameterization and that or if you want to think in maybe better language and you think of time as one of the variables doesn't in any way fix the sampling rate that you want to choose. You get something out that's independent of the sampling. Um, and I want to explain why that's something important. So you may or may not have thought about it, but one thing that machine learning hates, and indeed learning from data hates, is a symmetry. Symmetry is a really bad news for learning. Because what it actually means is there are many different representations of your object, all of which are somehow the same value. So you've got to learn that all these different representations correspond to the same output. And that can be very painful. I mean, if it's a rotation of a face, it's maybe not too bad because there's only a three dimensional group of rotations. Um, but if it's something infinite dimensional, that essentially means that you, you, the model you have, that your data was really lying on a low dimensional submanifold, so you can fit things to it, is simply not true. Because you see, you have these fibers, these infinite dimensional fibers going the other way, and the value can be anywhere in these, because that's the symmetry. They're just the same. They're the same object, just recorded in different ways. Symmetry is really, really bad news if you want to learn, because you have to learn that the symmetry doesn't matter. So that means that's already a case for mathematics or statistics, because if you can find a way of representing the data that squashes out that symmetry, that gives you a description that's invariant to the symmetry, then this is good news. Now, actually, people do this with curves, right? They do it with curves. They parameterize them at unit speed. Um, and that actually removes the symmetry, except that it requires the path to be of finite length, but worse than that, if it's multidimensional, it assumes you understand the right notion of length that's compatible with the different dimensions. If you're tracking a body, this is nonsense. Are you going to make the eyelids move at unit speed? Or are you going to make the arms move? There's so many different features of the body, and they're all traveling at completely different speeds, and it's not an answer. It's an ad hoc answer for paths of finite length once you've decided what your notion of distance is. But here is a three, and we'll all agree that it's a three. And we also agree that if we think of it as a time series classically, then we would look at the x coordinates as a function of time and the y coordinate as a function of time. And here's the x coordinate. But there are two versions of the x coordinate because I've simply changed the speed at which I drew the three. And you begin to see that already something tricky is going on because the action's happening in different places. And if we look at the two coordinates, the X and Y coordinate together in these two time sets, we see that actually very, very different graphs of values correspond to completely the same object. And you begin to realize that this is 
this is the symmetry I was talking about. Parameterization or sort of sampling is a, is a symmetry that doesn't change the curve. And you see it produces very different representations of the curve. And now you begin to see how wavelets and all these sorts of things start running into trouble because actually the focus and the interest simply moves around. It doesn't depend on the choice of your wavelets. It's got to be done differently to that. Sampling this curve is not an answer to it, really. Um, and again, you begin to see, are you going to make the X coordinates or the Y coordinate unit speed or the sum of the squares of them or whatever? It's not actually an easy answer. And it's not linear. This group of fibers is not linear. There's no linear factorization. You simply can't add them up. Now, how does one describe this curve without reference to the parameterization? But it turns out that this, the idea of how to do that goes back really to Katie Chen um, in the 50s and to the geometers and the topologists. Um, and they realized that actually you could do it by computing something called the signature. From my perspective, I would say I wouldn't treat the discussion in quite the same way, but I would end up looking at the same objects. I would say that a very natural way to understand a stream is by looking at its effects over intervals. So you don't look at it in terms of its values, which is Kolmogorov. Kolmogorov says we wanted, we had a function, we describe it by saying which interval it's in at this time or which interval it's in at this time, gates, if you think about it. Um, rather than that, we take the data over intervals and we look at what happens over an interval. And how do we get hold of that? How do we describe what happens over an interval? Well, perhaps the most interesting thing to do is to let the signal drive the solution to a differential equation. If we do that, it's sort of obvious. If we roll a ball along a curve, it doesn't matter how quickly we roll along the curve. We're going to end up in the same place at the end. So this is good. It's describing this little path without a parameterization. Um, So that's in principle a good idea. So you you take your stream of data and you don't describe it by its values. You don't tell, I don't describe a book by telling you that the 750th word was the, even though it might be true, it's not very informative. It's much better to say, well, the first third of the book introduced the characters. The second third of the book did something else. Describing its effects over intervals is a vastly more plausible way of describing a stream than giving its values at times. But the second thing is that actually from the math, there's a canonical choice of nonlinear system to look at. Um, and that is the, the nonlinear system given by this non-commutative exponential. Probably you don't know what tensor products are and things like that, but let's just understand that this is a differential equation. It's controlled by your input stream and the output is sort of like an exponential, so it's fundamental, but it's very non-commutative, and you can take the first few terms in it, and this is a crude description of what's going on in gamma over that interval, how it affects things. And this is the fundamental idea of rough path theory, that you should understand a path by understanding its effect on very stereotype nonlinear systems. Uh, yeah, uh, I've gone one too far. Yeah, and crucially, the output of this, we take a path segment, we solve the differential equation, we get the values. The output is a sequence of scalars, which are a bit like a Fourier series, except they grow exponentially because paths are infinite dimensional and very, uh, very complex potentially. And But the crucial thing is that rather than the classical Riemann approach where you take steps one at a time and you must do it very finely, it gives you a top-down description. It doesn't start off by going to the finest scale. This is why it works for rough paths. It starts with the coarsest scale and gives you the broadest description. And if you take a few more terms, you get more refinement. And so it goes on. But this actually gives you a good feature set for describing streams over short-ish intervals. And um, there are all sorts of theorems that say that that's actually enough to tell you everything. 
Now, sometimes, but I'm not sure I want to encourage this way of thinking about it, you can interpret this data as iterated integrals of um, smooth path, if the path was smooth. But actually, the whole idea of signature and everything makes really good sense when the paths have jumps and things, but it needs a little bit of thinking about. And people tend to go back to thinking about the integrals because this is what they know about. That's fine. But then they tend to get themselves into a struggle when the data is discontinuous and has jumps, and it would be much better if they thought the thing through a bit better. Um, but anyway, you have these coefficients, and they are actually iterated integrals if the paths were smooth. Um, and there's lots and lots of them. They grow very, very quickly. But the first few are informative, and that's where the top down begins to matter. And moreover, it's faithful. It's a completely faithful description. It captures exactly the path without the parameterization. There's something called tree light, but we won't go into that. Um, it captures the unparameterized path um, and does it cleanly. So it's this nonlinear filter that cuts out the sampling, the symmetry that you get from sampling. It doesn't care how you sample the data, providing you sample the data well enough. And this is actually very powerful because it dramatically reduces dimension. Also, but that's complicated to explain, if you want to understand the space of functions on unparameterized paths, and of course that's what ca um, classification and uh, machine learning is all about, functions on objects like this, then actually this is a basis for them. It's like Fourier series give you a basis of functions on the circle. So these iterated integrals are a natural basis for the functions on the space of unparameterized paths. So they turn, and this is a paper of how am I ages and ages ago, which has successfully been rejected three times from the RSS. Uh, well, what was it? Uh, the Annals of Statistics, yeah, Annals of Statistics, not RSS. Um, it actually allows you to understand that any statistical problem in stream data can essentially be where you want to predict the law of the future conditional on the past can be reduced at least formally to a linear regression problem using this signature representation. I don't think I want to keep an eye on my time, so I think we'll skip this, not least because Hal said something about it, except perhaps to mention that there are now several packages for computing these things. Uh, Jeremy's uh, package, II Signature, for example, is a good one. Our eSig is a bit long in the tooth at the moment, but is undergoing a radical rewrite under the hub. So in a few months' time, it'll probably be really as good as everybody else. Um, OK, so that's one important point. Another important point is actually just stability of the description. So as I said before, if you get these uh, different versions of three, they have very different wavelet expansions. Uh, of course, using the signature, they actually don't. They have the same expansion. Turns out that this way of describing the path is really very efficient um, compared with sampling. So if you sample a signal, it's easy to see if it's something like a Brownian motion that you really don't do very well in understanding its consequences. And the rate is like one over n. Or in fact, actually one over square root of n. On the other hand, if you sample it, if you describe it using the signature, it's fantastically efficient and grows essentially like one over n over two factorial, which is really pretty good. If you have n terms now, then this is the level of approximation you get. So it's miles better if you want to understand the consequences as a way of describing the data. So perhaps it's not surprising that these ways of looking at the data accelerate what one's going to do. So just to give you some simple illustrations, so this was a paper uh, by the Anne Wen's team, oh, which Hal and I were put near the end of. Um, but you can see clearly how as you increase the signature, you end up getting considerably better results. It gives you more information about what's going on. I don't want to go into more detail that because I've... The handwriting, this is the end of the handwriting. The handwriting it ultimately migrated from being an app 
written by the university into being taken up by Sugo, which is Sogu, which is one of the big uh, companies in China. And it's it's it was in, when they put it in there, it was one of their core elements. Uh, I don't know if they do now because they won't say what they do, but um, <clears throat> for a while it was on their website that this was the the machine that they use for the handwriting. Um, I want to go back very quickly to the people now. So you have this path. You have a way of translating the path into signatures. You don't do it naively with one long signature or you'd end up with huge number of terms. You tend to box it into signatures over relatively short intervals. It's a, it's a, it's a thing where you combine methodologies. You're able to make inference based on them to do things like work out what people are doing. Now, one of the attractions of doing this is that actually it copes with reasonably noisy data. So here and the other attraction, it works with small data. Um, and the other attraction is it works with anonymous data. But the um, here is an example of a, an off the peg software that succeeds in putting dots on people in the right places. But it's quite noisy when you really look at it. Um, I just wanted to show you how these things work very quickly. Right, so here is an example of that data I was showing you at the beginning, where they very carefully put handmade, not noisy, uh, landmarks on. But now if you, and here you see the noisy landmarks from the automated one and the Gulf. But using the noisy data, you can still do quite well, particularly if you add a third dimension, which is called confidence. And we'll see that later. So here is the sort of examples we worked when we, when we started getting serious about this stuff. Um, and we can, at the time, we were highly competitive. And I want to emphasize here the sort of scale of the problems. We're not talking like huge deep learning scales. We're talking about, and nor are we talking about overfitting. We're talking about 928 samples in 21 classes, and we get that. This one is exactly the one we were just looking at, where you have the noisy data. Now, here is interesting, you see, because they add RGB data in now. And if you add RGB data, of course, you don't maintain privacy. And the best is actually this one here, if you add RGB data. If you don't add RGB data, then uh we win i mean <clears throat> so sorry i'm not saying this very clearly if you start with the pose the good quality pose the no noise we do very well <clears throat> if you use the pose automated pose we don't do very well but we do better than everybody else on the other hand if we use if they use rgb they beat us but if we stick back in the confidence we can do it. So it's, it's no different to us. For our point of view, it's just a stream of data uh, associated with the various uh, vertices. And it really makes no difference to our analysis. By the way, you can download the software off the web to do these things. And uh, we've been using it in some other cases. Um, again, 300 samples from the Connect three dimensions. We, we managed to do quite well. All this stuff is quite old now, though. I'm sure that you can find people who've been doing things since. But one of the most important things about it is that it's actually interpretable. <clears throat> we can actually see, because what we do is we look at the pairs and the triples, and we form signatures of those in space, and then watch those evolving in time. Um, you can actually um, see the uh, which terms actually matter to the analysis. And so you get some idea that actually jumping involves uh, one part of your body and kicking another. It's actually very fun and interesting to do. Um, this is light entertainment. I don't know if you can guess what's happening here, but it's actually a little toddler. And it just shows you the variety of, um, the variety of different examples you really have to cope with to do sensible results. Um, but I thought I'd just finish with this, really. So the signature is this complicated transformation that removes the um, parameterization 
And you'll see later on in the other talks how it's used in other ways. Um, it's a faithful capturing of the path without the parameterizations. Now, what you see here is really quite recent work by Wei Shen Yang, one of our colleagues. And Wei Shen has been adopting a sort of optimization, deep learning perspective in a way on going from the signature back to the path. And the top is an abstract recovery of a path. I don't know if we can make it start from scratch again so you can, s whoops, no. So you see that here is the paths being recovered from their signatures by an optimization. And you can see it's actually quite amazing in a way how successfully it captures these complex curves just using these coefficients. And it captures the interaction between them, which happens first, which happens second. The other pictures are actually uh, maybe more interesting because they're that they show the depth of this. Right. So in this particular case, now we're using the signature that we were using for the action recognition and the data we're using for the action recognition. And now we're using that to reconstruct a new path at a different sample rate of the people moving. So this is actually the same thing as the one above. You've got a path, you've got its signatures, you reconstruct the signatures, but now you realize that what we're doing actually is doing it with people moving and you begin to realize that actually these tools can scale really quite well to quite complex situations um i guess i want to finish um i have i suppose a few more minutes but i don't really want to use them um the range of ways this stuff has been used is really quite large. The challenges of getting it recognized by the computer science community is also quite large uh, because actually they can do quite a few of these things. LSTM is a really clever idea and so on. Um, the challenge and the sort of thing I hope will come out of meetings like this is to understand that there is actually an area between them there is no doubt that the signature and related things like the log signature and dyadic versions of it and so on and so forth are actually really add to the way one can think about stream data. They make adding an extra variable, worrying about missing data that isn't missing, but simply different sampling becomes irrelevant. And as a result, there have been many, many examples now where things have worked well. I mean, for example, one of my students, uh, James Murill, uh, successfully won the, uh, oh, I forget the name of it, unfortunately, uh, the PhysioNet 2019 worldwide competition, which was using intensive care unit data to understand and predict um, whether somebody's about to get sepsis. And there were 100 teams from around the world of top universities in medical data science who all competed for this, and we competed for it, and we won. Um, it was actually rather funny because halfway through, James was a brand new but very smart, ambitious uh, applied math graduate student, and he was a bit fed up, actually, because we were averaging in the middle somewhere, and he would just... That wasn't what he thought he should be, and nor me, really, if I'm being honest. But then he discovered a bug in his code and that he hadn't been using the log signatures correctly. And in fact, he'd been using my code for decoding them and Jeremy's code for coding them, and we don't use quite the same basis. And so actually was producing nonsense. And when he realized that and corrected it, all of a sudden, uh, he leapt to first position in the leader table and he never fell back from that position for the rest of the time. So actually looking at the signature properly, log signatures and so on, really adds extra value. And health data, ICU data, is a really good example of stream data where all sorts of different things are happening at different rates. There's no reliability of sampling and so on and so forth. It's the sort of thing that this, data, this approach is actually, you know, comfortable with, with no hassle and with relatively little work actually in terms of preparing the data and all the rest of it. The range of applications is huge. As I said, there's a project going on in cybersecurity at the moment. Um, another one of my students has done some great work with uh, 
another colleague, uh, Maud, on agricultural data, where in fact what we're looking at is the distribution of paths, and you've got a, a, a function on distributions of paths. Uh, in that case, they were the behavior of in different fields uh, in France. Um, yeah, I don't want to say any more. Um, I want to allow some time for questioning. I'm absolutely happy to answer questions, and I thank you very much for listening, if you have. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for Terry's great talk. Uh, so uh, if you have any uh, a question, um, please uh, feel free to type in the uh, chat box. So we have a question from Remy um, regarding the example with the skeletons. What happens if an actual person enters the frame? Are uh, actual nodes dynamically added to the picture? Um, so I'm just trying to find the question if I can read it through. Um, oh yes, okay. Um, Okay, so that's a question really about um, the the application software that we were using, uh, OpenPose or AlphaPose, which take images and then put um, put uh, landmarks in the right places on them. Most of them know about people and will do their best to um, say another person has come into the frame, but actually they are really um, they're really um, quite complex in reality. So we have a project with the health and safety executive where they're looking at people on escalators, walking up escalators uh, with a view to understanding whether in certain situations people do more dangerous behavior. They get distracted more or they carry too much shopping and things like that. And um, so, that relies on an automated recognition of the people, but it gets complicated because you see you have reflections of people on the sides of the escalator and it starts to put two people in and three people in. But by and large, actually, with a bit of real work, um, with a bit of real work, it can be done. You tidy that up and you know whether it's one people or two people. In fact, the 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 Xbox data uh, that I took, the Kinect data that I, I showed you the results from actually did have two people in it some of the time, but not all of the time. And some of the activities involve two people and some of the activities only involve one person. But I think by and large, you should assume that we know which blobs are meant to be one person and we know which blobs are meant to be the other. But bear in mind, that's a good example of data that disappears. As people spin around, you know, various landmarks suddenly disappear and then reappear again. Um, I haven't had the time, unfortunately, to really explain the sort of basic mathematical framework they fit into, but it's a very clean framework where really you're looking at an evolving vector field on n data points, 15 data points in R3 or something, or in R4 if you want to put in the uncertainty. don't know if that helps. Yeah. Remy asked whether some dimension are set to zero and just pick up at some point. I think that's yes, right? Yeah, I think Remy is said it's clear now. Uh, yes. Joseph, would you like to raise your question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I, yeah, of course I can, Joseph, yeah. Right. So signatures, uh, a great way to store uh, information from curves, so maps from from real numbers to some vector space, uh, to extract features from that map. Um, has there been any development to create an analog of signature when you are not having a map from time, but from a higher dimensional set? Let's say R2 or R3. That's what Martin Hira does. Yes, but uh, I mean, so but yeah, there's two points here, right? One is the hard point. The most non-commutative is in one dimension, right? Yeah. One dimensional time is the thing that allows order to come in. As soon as you have a function of two variables, 
then actually what you're saying is going around one way or going around the other way actually doesn't produce a different answer. So there's a large amount of commutativity comes in at this point. So you could do it just by having a space filling curve parameterizing your space. And in fact, that can really make sense. And in fact, that has actually been tried. Um, so you, you want to understand an image, say, then one way to understand an image is to think of like a, a space filling um, Z Morton ordering type way of it going around the space and then looking at the path you get. Um, to do that well, though, you need to introduce some sort of rotation invariance because you want the representation somehow not to care about how you rotate the underlying path. And that's the sort of thing maybe Yosha would know how to add some value to. So I think the answer is yes and no. Um, there is an argument that says that actually the function case is, is simpler in some sense. Not, not in, I mean, it allows you to do more complicated questions, therefore. Um, and that in a way, it's exactly what Martin Hyras studies. Um, but there's another way of thinking of it, which says, actually, if you really want to understand an image, you really ought to be able to understand what happens to every path through the image. And to do that, you begin to see you really need the full rough path theory, actually. If you have a colored image and you explore it along a curve in the parameter space, but the, the, a full rough path. the big advantage of signature is that you precisely know how to change its coordinates if you make the curve a little bit longer. So if you extend time by, let's say, one additional tick, then you know precisely how to get. In other words, signature is the solution of a dynamical system, whereas the procedure you mentioned does not produce a dynamical system in this two dimensional situation. And that's a disadvantage. So if the image is suddenly enlarged, you have to redo the whole procedure. Yeah. And that's the disadvantage. And the big advantage of signature is that if you enlarge the interval in time a little bit, you know precisely what to add to the signature coordinates in order to get signature again. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think it's not so clear how to do that in a, in a, in a non-ordered space. No, I, I, I agree. I, I just, I, I totally agree. And um, but there's, you see, the, but I guess the point I'm trying to make actually is there is there are so there are two two crucial things in data science where the mathematicians are trying to make inroads. One I would say is in the evolving systems, which is the rough path picture, and the other one is in the exchangeable systems, where actually you have the points, but you don't really care what order they come in. Uh, you're just filling out the space. Um, and that's what TDA is doing. Um, and it's interesting to mix the two, but I suspect they have their own ways of doing things. Anyway, I don't have a full answer. Of course, you're right, but it's a complicated problem with many challenges. Okay, thank you. During Karimidi, uh, we have uh, a little bit of time for the last question. Could you comment what type of the agriculture data for crop growth? Growth, do you use draw images or the growth assessment by farmers or something else? By Julia. Yeah, I think actually Chris should answer this and he already has on the chat. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, he has. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you, Terry, again. So let's move on to the, uh, the second. Uh, thank you very much for your patience and uh, I look forward to the next talk. Yeah, thank you. So uh, our second speaker, Dr. Xing Zhang, uh, she is an associate professor with School of Electronic and Information Engineering, South China University of the Technology. She was a visiting scholar in Bioinformatic Research Imaging Center, University of North Carolina and Chapel Hill from 2018 to 20. 2020. Her research interests include computer vision, pattern recognition, gesture estimation, and brain data analysis. She is going to give a talk on multi strain neural network based infant cognitive score prediction. Welcome, Xin. Yeah.
Hi, can you hear me? Can you see yeah. me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, this is Xin Zhang uh, from South China University of Technology. It's my great honor to do the presentation here. Um, I'm in China, so it's a thanks to the technology. We can talk and share things together. So um, I will talk about the topic is something I've done in UNC when I was a scholar, a visiting scholar there. Um, so uh, first I will talk about the motivation and challenges. So it's kind of medical related topic. So um, during the infancy and the toddler years, there's a stunning rapid development of human brains, not only in terms of the size, but also the capability, um, including the learning ability, talking ability, or social emo emotional ability. So, um, so with the help of MRI, MRI images and the uh, image processing technology, um, we can have a well-processed tools to deal with the uh, infant brain and toddler brain, um, and we can have their um, MRI image or their brain structure to be measured and studied. So with the help of those skills, we can have a profound understanding of how the brain is developed and uh, how that connected to our ability. So in this research, we focus on the cognitive skill, um, which can also be referred as cognitive functions, cognitive ability, or cognitive capability. So mainly they are um, related to our perception, attention, memory, learning, decision making, and everything related to our daily work. And also those kind of cognitive skills have a very strong relationship with the brain structure. So um, to measure the cognitive ability, there is something called the Muller Scale of Early Learning, MSEL, which is a standard to design. Um, they have this set tools to measure the development in infants and the preschool preschoolers. So generally there are five cognitive scales to measure the uh, visual ability, motion ability, language ability, and the learning ability. Those um, are five scales used mostly to represent the uh, learning ability or the cognitive skills um, of the uh, kids, um, infancy, or toddler years. So in our research, our research goal actually is to understand the quantitative relationship between the morphological feature of the infant brain cortex and the cognitive skills. So generally we can draw a picture like this or illustrate our research goal like this. We have a, a, a infant apart, um, who has, we have their um, MRI scans and based on the image processing tools, we can extract their morphological features um, like of their brain. And also we want to have ability based on the machine learning method. Based on those scans, we can predict their cognitive skills. So in that case, if there's some um, uh, cognitive real life disease related, we can discover that in early. And also we can um, review the relationship between the brain structure and the cognitive ability. So that's our research goal. So um, we have mainly three challenges of these research topic. The first one is small data set. Um, in our data set, we have actually we have the largest data set actually, but we only have 23 testing subjects. And uh, we have all their T1, W and T2, W MRI images. And also in our experimental design, we're supposed to have them have their MRI scan at their birth, three months, six months, nine months, till their 48 months. So we are supposed to have their nine scans. But actually, not all of the uh, participants are able to show up at all scheduled time points. So we have a lot of missing data situation. This is an illustration of the data set we have. So 
this axis indicating subjects, this axis indicating the scan we have. You can see, especially at a um, later time, the scan is missing a lot. So this is uh, our first two challenges. The third challenge. Hold on. The third challenge is dimensional features. So we have their MRI scans, and based on the uh, infant pipeline we just mentioned, we can extract or we can first pars parcelate the brain into different um, meaningful regions. We refer that as ROI or brain regions. And in this work, we divide the brain into 70 different regions. That means we have 70 ROIs. And then for each region, we can compute seven different morphological cortical measurements. So we have seven features. So all together, um, our uh, dimensionality of the feature set is really high. It's nine by 17 by seven. So remember, we only have 23 testing subjects involved in our uh, project. And now the data set for every subject is this large. So the third challenge is the high dimensionality features versus small data sets. So those are three challenges we're facing of this research. Um, so for this kind of research, um, since cognitive skill is a very important um, measurement of human intelligence, so there are a lot of work doing that. So early work mostly relies on the statistical analysis. They try to based on the data set, uh, based on their um, long term uh, tracking history of participant subjects. They can do the uh, statistical analysis to um, discover the relationship or, or the impact of different cortical structures on the cognitive functions. But um, it is very hard to do the exact prediction or quantitative analysis of their relationship. So um, recent years, with the help of the uh, machine learning theorists, and people are trying to develop machine learning method to deal with this kind of issues. So um, I have cited the two most recent and the most relevant research with our research. So um, the first one they um, published in 19, 20, 2019. So uh, they use a bag of words, which is the uh, feature compacting machine learning method. Uh, to slash the overlap dimensionality of the neural image data, and then they can do um, latent space or condense the low dimensional representation. And by clust clustering, they can do the uh, prediction. And another method, they are uh, using the multi-view representation learning to learn a joint latent space. And then the mapping function from the uh, brain features to the according to skill is based on that latent space function. So those two methods are uh, most relevant to uh, our research, but they cannot do the uh, relationship analysis between the uh, brain features and the cognitive skills because they learn a condensed space. The condensed space will prevent them to build a real direct connection or relationship. And also um, they don't pay attention or they, they don't extract the temporal feature representation of the uh, brain uh, representation. So that's the two parts. Our work can fill in the gap in here. So um, hold on. OK, before I move on to talk about our work, since this is about past signature, so I will review a little bit of work we have done about past signature and its applications. And this work actually, it's um, with my team, Terry just mentioned about Professor Jing, and they're writing about OCR. So um, I listened to Terry's talk and delete and change a little bit about my talk. So um, Terry's talk is mostly about online character recognition, and this is more about um, a line and a, um, it's about the language. So for the written part, uh, you can have a stroke, which can be equally distant samples at several points. And for every point, you can have a sliding window. And based on that sliding window, you can compute the path signature. 
features, and that path signature features can later on to be used as recognition like this. This is a paper uh, Terry also mentioned. So this is not just a single character, it's about text line. So for every stroke along this text line, and we can use a sliding window to um, compute their path signature, and this is a trunky level, and they put every trunky level together, and then the stroke of the written will be converted into images. And then the later on recognition can use CNN to do the direct um, convolution based uh, recognition. So they converted um, stroke wise recognition into image wise recognition. So that based on the help of past signature features, um, it's a very effective way. So the other work is my student and we have published last year is about hand gesture recognition. So um, similar as um, Terry just mentioned about the uh, human body, here is um, we treat the hand trajectory as a path. And besides that, we actually define more paths than just trajectory. Um, so we define raw coordinates and also we define the uh, temporal trajectory as a path. And also we define a spatial relationship. That means we define several joints as a path and then we consider that a spatial path. And so we also extract the path signature based on that spatial relationship. And also we further have a, you can consider that a higher level signature with, we refer that to spatial temporal path signature. So um, based on the hand gesture, we actually have four different um, features. Then those four different features are combined separately, and in the end, they will feed in the neural network based classification, and we can reach a very nice result of the uh, hand gesture recognition. So that's something I think it's um, something we have done that actually inspired me of current work on the uh, cognitive skill recognition. So now let me go back to the uh, brain feature and a cognitive skill relationship discovery. So in this work, we propose something called brain PSNet. Um, so before I go to the detail about the uh, math or <laughs> design detail, I will introduce some general ideas, the ideas that why we design or how we formulate. First, we formulate this problem as a neural network based regression problem because the input based after the image processing process, we consider that as a dy dynamic feature maps, or you can consider that as a tensor. It's actually a high dimensional matrix. And then the output is just the cognitive scores. You can estimate them joined together, I mean five scores together, or single cognitive scores, so one by one. So we refer this one as a re regression problem. And to solve this regression problem, we think we pr prefer to use a neural network. It is not CNN because it's not image based, but it's just neural network. So this is our first idea. So the second idea is based on my previous research about, about hand gesture. So I think defining the path is very important to use the path signature to help us extract the features. So how to define the path? So for this problem, we think along the time, because the brain changed dramatically along this time, uh, time dimensional time points. So we think we can define the temporal path along the longitudinal data. So we define the path of every ROI along the longitudinal data. So that means we have 17 ROIs, we have 17 paths for every subject and every path we can define that temporal path and we can use path signature to further help us extract the temporal based features. So that's the second of thinking. So the third is when we design this um, model because the dimensionality is very high. So we are focused on the fixture extraction selection with the help path signature and also the redundancy removal when we design this neural network. So all three are general ideas when we design this um, network. So um, this is a detail about a brain PS net we have proposed. And the, um, in this network, we first do the dimensionality reduction, and then we propose this TPS layer. The TPS refers to the temporal path signature. 
So the path is defined on this longitudinal points. And these two jointly, we design a two stream neural network for the uh, for the regression part. And then also in between, we design this attention mask generator, which um, because from the literature we have read, we figure out um, some brain regions are more important than other brain regions uh, in terms of the cognitive skills. So we think this kind of attention mask can help us reduce redundancy. So we'll also propose this learnable based attention mask generator. Altogether, we have this uh, brain PS net and to find the cognitive skills. So this is a more abstract version and I have a detailed version. <laughs> I know there is a lot of parameters, uh, but this paper has published. If uh, you're interested in these, um, you can refer to our papers. So I will just talk about the general ideas. So first part is dimensionality reduction. We use the one-to-one -one convolutional layer, which is inspired by GoogleNet. Um, we reduce the dimensionality. This is the first step. And then we propose this two-stream network. The, Upper part is a uh, path signature based feature learning and extraction. The lower part is the raw data based feature learning and extraction. So these two parts will have their extracted feature and then at the last they will uh, concatenate it together and essentially based on a fully connected layer, we can have a cognitive score predicted. Uh, yeah, predicted. This is the final cognitive score. So these are the two stream network. So attention mask is somewhere in between, and this actually is learnable. So when, we, when you train this model, you also train this attention mask generator. So the attention mask is added on two streams separately. So they actually will have the weights on different regions, uh, 70 here. Um, this is the dot products, actually. It's element-wise multiplication. So this attention mask will multiply on different ROIs to make sure different ROI will have a different weight, so different inferential and on the final results. And we also propose something called a group fully connected layers because of the uh, along the temporal sampling process, their um, interval time is pretty large and the, uh, the development is not continuous. Um, so we propose this group fully connected layer to um, isolated temporal influential along this process uh, because the temporal feature is actually extracted in in TPS layer. So uh, in the uh, group fully connected layer, we try to isolate them separately. So in this part, I, um, I think. Um, there's a lot of details. I cannot uh, explain one by one, but uh, if you're interested, um, you can refer to our paper. And I want to explain more about temporal path signature layer since I, um, this is more about path signature. So this part is how we de define the path signature. If you still remember, we have the input here is nine by 70 by four. So nine is still the time points, 70 are the, uh, Brain regions and four are the dimensionality after dimensionality reduction of features. So we define a 70 passes, as I just mentioned. For every brain regions along the time, we define one path. So all together, we have 70 passes. And then for each path, we will apply on a sliding window. So for every sliding window, we will cover different time points. And for within that window, we can extract their corresponding path signature features. So it means within every sliding window, we can extract their path signature features. And then further, we apply the one by one convolution layer to do the dimensionality reduction. So this is the output we have uh, for the TPS layer, which is um, after the path signature feature extraction. And this will be the output for the uh, classification uh, layer. So here is our definition about uh, TPS. So there's one question I think it's worth to be discussed here. It's actually when we um, first try to use path signature, I, uh, have, I have a lot of discussion with how about uh, 
how to define the path. Why do we use this longitudinal data as a path? That means we define a path along here. Why not use other informations? For example, we still have brain regions. Why don't use brain neighboring relationship? And they um, use other structuring relationship. Um, to be honest, we do a lot of trying and testing, and but those um, doesn't give us meaningful results. And then later on, I realized because I just entered the medical field. Then I realized actually in the brain study, um, they have figured out that a physical um, neighboring relationship doesn't represent their real brain connection relationship. I don't know whether that makes sense because the uh, information passing in brain is between neural. That neural is not based on the neighbor relationship. It's based on the neural connection. So um, it doesn't make sense to build a path based on the neighbor relationship. We have to build a path based on the neural. So this is something we're still working on. So um, the inspiration or something I want to share here is um, you need to find a when you have a real problem, the path need actually have have a clear physical meaning or have some meaning for um, and have some meaning behind you construct this path. OK, so um, this is a TPS layer, so that's the uh, our model. And then um, for the experimental part, we do uh, several experiments and first about path signature feature computation. That's just for this talk, <laughs> um, I do some um, experiment to show how do we set up parameters and then we do the ablation study and also we compare the effectiveness of TPS features and then we compare with state of arts and discover the relationship between the cognitive score and brain regions. So um, this part is since we have uh, two parameters to be set about path signature, one is sliding window, the second is the truncated level. So um, we uh, set different trunk uh, window size and different trunk levels and compare the results. Those are five cognitive scores. Uh, we here report error, and this is the average error we have. So, so the smaller, the better. So um, here you can see with the window size increase, we don't see a dramatic um, better improvement of the results is because larger windows as like I said the, the time slot is now continuous so they have a lot of gap between them and also for the trunky level the larger trunky level will give you more information but also will give you more parameters so you need to find a balance between them so these results are showing um, how do we choose the parameters? So in this work, we said W was a four and trunky level was two. And this is the ablation study. We want to test the effectiveness of our TPS model and attention module. So what we do is we remove the TPS module and report experiments like here. And you can see the TPS actually does improve the result a lot. Similarly, we remove the tension module. You can see that also improved the results a lot. So um, this, is, this is the ablation study. And this is the effectiveness of TPS layer. This is actually when we submit a paper, the reviewer suggests, and I think that's a very brilliant experimental suggestion. So they're suggesting us to say, since we are claiming these TPS layer can help us find the temporal features, and these temporal features can help us later on to do the score prediction. So they're asking, how do you know TPS is the right one to find the temporal features? You know, there's a lot of ways to learn the temporal features, for, for example, LSTM or transformer. So we think this is a very brilliant suggestion. So we do the experiments by changing TPS layers. We take out these TPS layers, we put LSTM in here, or we put a transformer in here, try to extract the temporal feature. And then you can, this is our exper experimental result. We compare the IMSC, which is arrow, and also the R squared of two measurements, and also we compare the time. You can see 
both in terms of time or the performance, the TPS layer shows clear advantages. So that means in terms of extracting temporal features, path signature, the temporal path signature actually outperform LSTM and transformer. So that means they can effectively extract the temporal features along the time slot we're having there. And also it is most, it's the fastest one, fastest one. So um, this experiment actually further illustrate the effectiveness of TPS layer. And also this is our comparison with the state of arts. And we have five relative um, methods using the same data set. Some are their data, some are we re-implemented and our results are the best. And actually we are way more, we have way more smaller error than theirs. And we have a new version, which is much smaller than current version. So the, the performance actually show um, our method is very effective here. And also things at the very beginning, uh, when people doing the brain research, they want to know they don't not they not only care about model, they also care about how can you review the brain region relationship. So we do the uh, back tracing since our model are just simple neural network model. So we can do the back tracing to find out um, which features are more uh, if influential on the uh, different cognitive scores. And uh, you can see the corti cortical curvature features actually have a strong influence in most of their cognitive skills and other features have various importance and uh, these five figures are actually showing the most important brain regions for different um, cognitive skills and we summarize the top five most important brain regions for each cognitive skills so you can see all together there are only 10 brain regions that are very important or closely connected with cognitive skills. And at the very beginning, we actually have a 70. So that means the rest of 60 doesn't really have a strong influential um, impact or strong with these cognitive skills. Um, so um, these are something we have discovered. So for the summary, uh, we propose this novel brain PS model and we for the first time to use the path signature features to explore the hidden um, temporal features along the cognitive development trajectory and also we try to discover the uh, brain region and the cognitive scores relationship. So the future work is uh, the further brain region selection strategy might be helpful it's um, in our current ex experiments, it actually improved the results a lot. And also um, different temporal or spatial path could be considered, like I have just discussed with the TPS layer part. Uh, we probably need to try to discover the real brain connection, not just the uh, physical brain connection. And that might really further help the cognitive skill discover. So, um, this work is done when I was a visiting scholar in the UNC, and this is actually a joint work with my undergraduate student. Um, and he's my master's student right now. And uh, Dr. Ni and uh, Dr. Lee from UNC. Um, so the detail of this paper is published in Mikai 2020. Okay, um, thank you very much. That's everything I want to share today. Thank you very much especially for giving the talk in the late time in China. It's okay, it's okay. Yeah, it's a very interesting talk. So uh, we have a few questions here. So the first question of, uh, from Peter Bloomfield. So uh, in your uh, uh, sorry, ROIs, how are you approaching gray and white matter composition through development? And is this three P M R I? Can I read his question? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's um, easier to read it in the meeting chat. 
uh, how your approach green man composition? Oh, OK. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, that's actually my collaborator, Dr. Lee in UNC. They have, um, I think they put their software uh, public available. They have this pipeline. Um, you just use a T1 W and T2 W and into um, their pipeline and the, they will give you cortical features. So I don't use the great white matters. I only use the surface. So I don't know. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. And the uh, second question from Georgia, after learning are some of the ways inter interpretable, like the yes. ways in the IN? Yes, the weights are interpretable. That's how we have the back propagation to find the uh, uh, weights of the, uh, the importance of the uh, brain regions. So they are interpretable because they're just neural network. So yeah, it is interpretable. Yeah, so uh, we also have a question from Remy about the uh, attention mask generator. Uh, isn't the correction between the two different sets of the past captured as the last step anyway? Can you quickly go over the intuition that leads you to it? Isn't the correlation between two different sets? Um, I don't actually understand this question. Uh, what do you mean different two sets of paths capture and last step? Uh, are you saying the attention output? The attention output in this method, we don't actually use that, but just use that for the training purpose. But in our future work, we will use that um, as attention go back to the time slot because that part is actually unfinished. We we'll only use the middle results. So we will use that back to the uh, time slot. Yeah, the, the uh, intuition, yeah, the intuition is just we, uh, from the literature we find out not all brain regions are closely connected with the uh, cognitive scores, so. Yeah, so I think the last question is from the Alex. Are there ethical issues associated with <laughs> the automated assessment of the cognitive skills beyond those generally presenting pediatrics? OK, um, I think for the uh, research, I think it's two parts. For the research purpose, when we obtain the data, we actually um, pass this um, uh, ethical issue and everyone with a fully documented sign they are aware their data will be used for the uh, research study and um, for that's for the research and uh, for the medical issue um, this cognitive skill is just not to predict the intellectual level it's actually related to a lot of disease like autism uh, like ADHD so um, if we can early predict some um, under development or some strange situation, we can help them um, in the advanced stage rather than because um, all those diagnoses, um, autism, ADHD, will wait until um, the baby can talk, can show, can interaction. But at that time, it might be too late. So all the research goal is to have a early intervention before the kids are too old. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for seeing okay. this answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, I think if you could reply to Rami in the chat. Okay, okay. Why not you say in Africa? Okay, that's a great question. Um, if you um. If you read SIN, the most motive or the most application of SIN is actually image based because SIN has a strong uh, capability to representing neighboring relationship. If you have a smooth neighboring structure, 
However, in our problem or in the brain study, um, they are not images. They are just uh, individual features. They are kind of separate data points. So they don't possess this kind of smoothness locally. So CNN is actually not um, the right tool to be used, actually. No. Yeah, I think we, we have to stop here <laughs> and okay. because of the time limit. Thank you very much for uh, this talk. Yeah, so now uh, it's the time for the panel discussion. Uh, at first, I'd like to introduce the co-chair of the panel discussion, Dr. Tom Cash. Uh, he is a reader in the mathematical department at Imperial College and the co-investigator of the data set. Uh, his research interests uh, uh, include areas of the stochastic analysis, such as modern calculus and rock theory, as well as uh, mathematical finance. Um, Tom, would you like to start uh, with the first part? Yes, OK. I think what we're going to do, first of all, I'm going to ask the four panelists to introduce themselves and explain a little bit about their backgrounds and their journey in mathematics and data science and how um, their research interacts with rough path theory and data science and something of their evolution as well. Um, once we've finished with that initial part, then we will go into a more general uh, questioning um, session. So do, as the discussion evolves, please continue to post your questions in the chat box because there will be time, I think, at the end of the discussion, hopefully to revisit some of them and put them to the panelists. So the four panelists are our four speakers today, two of whom we've heard from already. So perhaps I would like to first of all invite the two speakers that we haven't heard from uh, to introduce themselves and explain a little bit of their, their research interests. Um, and so perhaps we could start, since I can see Yosha there on my screen, perhaps we could start with Yosha Deal who is a professor at the University of uh, Greifswald in Germany. And yes. uh, Joscha, over to you. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you, Hao and everyone else. This is a very nice meeting. Yeah, I'm in uh, Greifswald now, beautiful city on the Baltic Sea. But I started my journey in rough pass business um, by a summer school that Terry gave in 2009, I think. He talked about uh, rough pass. And I didn't understand much, but uh, Terry is apparently a good salesman, so I really got interested. And then I luckily got the PhD position with Peter Fritz in Berlin. So I did a bunch of uh, rough path analysis and so on. And then I did a quick detour into invariant theory. Terry talked already about this. This has some significant relation to machine learning. In 2013, I did that. But then I got... Uh, back on track and worked on SPDs and singular SPDs for a while until I realized that I like algebra more. And then I went back to the uh, invariant business together with Jeremy Reisenstein, who's a participant as well today. We went back to invariants. And since then, I'm mostly working on uh, questions in algebra motivated from uh, machine learning slash um, signatures. Thank you very much, uh, Joscha. And next, I will go to uh, Josef Teichmann, Professor Teichmann, yeah, Professor of Mathematics at ETH Zurich. And, uh, Please, we can leave away the professor, Josef Teichmann. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, everybody. I'm Josef Teichmann, uh, Professor of Mathematics at, uh, at uh, ETH Zurich, the Polytechnical uh, Institute in Zurich. And uh, my research interests are uh, in mathematical finance, stochastic analysis, geometry of stochastic differential equations, and Malyavan calculus. And uh, since the early 2000s, also in rough path theory, I have been listening to talks of Terry. I think the first talk was at the birthday conference of Hans Firma in the early 2000s. And from the early days, I have been fascinated by this uh, subject. And uh, recently, I got very much interested in machine learning, and I'm investigating in the moment uh, connections between, let's say, rough path theory, uh, feature extraction, randomness, and uh, machine learning, and everything with applications to mathematical finance. 
I did not hear you, Thomas. I'm sorry, I muted myself. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yuzu, um, for that introduction. And uh, Xin Shang, perhaps we can turn yeah. to you now. Um, now, of, of all the four panelists, you're the only one who's not a mathematician by background. So it would be, I think, especially interesting to hear how you how rough path theory came to feature in your research. OK, um, it really makes me nervous to have a meeting with all the mathematicians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just engineering background, but um, from our perspective, it's not just me. Uh, we have a whole group actually have a uh, several years collaboration with uh, Professor Lyons and Dr. Ni. Nee. Um, so from our per uh, point of view, we think a uh, past signature rapha theory is a powerful tool to extract the features if you have a well-defined or meaningful path. So um, like we have just discussed about the, uh, how do we extract those kind of features? CNN is very popular to do the image-based uh, feature extraction, but um, it doesn't really work very well on the path on the one dimensional situation or other graph graphic situation. Then we, um, starting from the handwriting character recognition, a passive signature actually can provide us more um, meaningful features, and those features can actually help us reach a very nice results. So thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. And may, I, may I make a little comment just to the, a relaxing statement? At ETH in Zurich, it is like that, that the mathematicians are always afraid when they meet engineers. Okay. <laughs> engineers are the powerful people at ETH, not the mathematicians. So okay. in that sense, I think uh, it's vice versa. Yes, okay. I think, I think anxiety can operate in both directions. Yeah. Um, last but not least, uh, Terry. Yeah, hi, I'm a mathematician who's slowly been corrupted into applications and things with actually with strong enthusiasm in fact um, <clears throat> my origins in rough path theory were actually driven by examples so there was a time when stochastic analysis was very well developed and there were some theorems around which said that you could no go no further that this was the right logical place to stop under certain hypotheses but we were at that time developing actually with european funding, and uh, this was about 1990, uh, software to s numerically integrate stochastic differential equations, because at that time they, was, they were treated as very theoretical. They weren't practical tools at all in most areas, and uh, I wanted to make them more practical by software, and it became apparent that if you thought about your Brownian motion using Levy construction or something, the solutions were really defined for each path. And you could change the equation, you could construct flows, and it became obvious that there was something there. Uh, and also at the same time, we did some work with forward, backward martingales and things, which also proved that actually the theoretical theorem wasn't really a theorem. Well, it was a theorem, but it was subject to hypotheses. And if you change the hypotheses, you got different conclusions. So actually, from those two, we became to have clear evidence that there was more to stochastic calculus than was presented by stochastic calculus. And actually, that's how rough path theory started. And um, if you're doing numerical methods in SDEs, iterated integrals are natural. And <clears throat> it is actually how it became, how it came into work. And uh, slowly it became what it is now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Terry. That could be the first chapter of an autobiography at some point in the future. No chance. Um, <laughs> How, how I think uh, you want to ask a question. Yeah, so let's move to the second part of the roundtable discussion. Uh, we, uh, the first question to all the panelists, uh, what are the main area where the RAPA theory can help tackle machine learning problems? What are big topics are there in this space and uh, what is the long-term vision from <clears> your view? <throat> Uh, Terry, would you like to start? Um, 
I think it operates in many different levels. I think we've heard a little bit about um, interpretation. Underneath it, uh, rough path theory tells you that evolving data is extraordinarily complicated, but gives you the language to talk about that and the language to classify it and the language, in fact, eventually to say, well, we don't care about those bits and we do care about these bits. And I think that will ultimately become quite important because it will also be part of what makes computation scalable on the inference side by understanding which bits matter and which bits don't. You can reduce the computational effort quite considerably. So I think that's one end of it. But at the other end of it, I think what's going on at the moment with um, some of my students is actually the, the idea of controlled rough differential equations where the neural neural controlled rough differential equations so where essentially the neural net is being used to find the right dynamical system is something which i think will also have a great many dividends actually because it will it allows you to harvest the fact that we understand well how to describe complex oscillatory data over short periods using signatures. And I think in the end, it's going to be very powerful and at the opposite extreme. So I think, in fact, there's a wide range of interactions. The main limitation at the moment is undoubtedly the speed at which data science is moving and the speed at which mathematicians move are not that compatible. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Joseph, would you like to uh, share your view? You ask me? Yeah. I mean, I see it a little bit more from the point of view of mathematical finance or finance and economics. And there have been fine statistical econometric techniques, which are essentially path space functionals. So you observe a certain time series and uh, given the time series, you try to draw conclusions, be it a drift measurement or a volatility measurement or also a strategy, uh, which is an adapted uh, uh, path-based functional. And all those um, functionals are usually uh, constructed by certain model assumptions or model views uh, on a phenomenon, on a dynamic phenomenon, which we consider. And in my view, a rough path theory signature allows you to enter a completely non-parametric way how to deal with those objects and apply that to different problems, as Terry mentions, optimization problems, games, and uh, this non-parametric sort of model free or robust way how to attack those problems and learn certain parameters is fascinating in many areas. We see a lot of uh, new results emerging by just having now model free ways of drift, drift estimation and um, um, model free ways how to learn or how to parameterize certain strategies. Machine learning Classical machine learning uh, with neural networks or recurrent neural networks gives one perspective on it. Um, in my view, rough path theory complements in a provable way those perspectives and uh, shows new directions. And that's very fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Georgia, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you. So my point of view is always motivated from invariance at the moment. Yeah, so so already mentioned here twice now the reparametrization invariance of signatures. I, this is very, very fundamental. And uh, I think this is how I approach problems now, thinking about invariance. And um, so we did this for discrete time series then. It's a slightly different invariance, but it's also a time warping invariance. And uh, we, we're continuing on this road. Um, so it's not always immediately uh, motivated from data science because uh, it's uh, sometimes frustrating to chase 
ch chase uh, the results there. It's it's as Terry already said, it's mostly possible because they are really masters of their craft. But um, to have some some abstract goals in mind, right? I would like to classify all invariants that do that and that and that, and then chase after that. That's and yeah, and rough paths and signatures is one part of that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Steve, would you like to share your views, which might be well, different from the mathematician? OK, uh, since we're motivation driven, so, uh, or we say problem solution driven, so uh, we always want to um, test and try. It's actually part of our research. It's not theory based. We test and try. So um, we're looking for um, powerful representation in the models. So I think that's the uh, most part we're from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. So the next question from the panel is a more general question in a sense, but uh, on a day to day basis, we're all concerned with our research, which by definition is specific in nature and addresses particular problems. But the last decade has seen um, progress across a range of uh, important problems in machine learning, image classification, speech recognition, natural language tasks, and so on. How do the panel think that this era of progress will be viewed in 50 years time? As the start of something really fresh or a full storm? Uh, Terry, would you like to tackle that one? Are you asking the? I missed a little bit of the question, probably because I haven't done my homework. Um, are you asking the question about data science or about the rough path intervention in data science? No, about data science, but obviously from your own personal point of view. Okay, I am absolutely sure that there is some. There has been a phase transition in understanding of how you model functions. Right? That it is clear that. You do much better by iterating and then by doing optimization. It offers a far better range of getting to things and getting things that model things to the extent that we can model complicated functions like translating languages. I think there's been a phase transition in that, just as there was a phase transition in numbers when we went from a system of Roman letters where every letter represents a different number to decimals, which are actually an iterative process where you 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 know you take tens and then tens of tens and tens of tens of tens and you describe exponentially many things with n symbols. It's the same fundamental idea and it's been introduced into a range of new functions functions we really care about. It's all the problems of ethics. There's all the problems of all these different things. I don't really believe the problems are much different if you let human beings do it. Um, and that's sort of the problem with the policing and so on. But I mean, the problems are huge in there. But I think our ability to understand complex functions is really quite radical and has fundamentally changed and will be regarded as having fundamentally changed. But, um, you know, it's It'll have its hiccups, I suspect, but I don't think, and it's our ability to optimize as well, the ability to get in there and actually find something that does the job. There are so many problems in this world where you don't actually care about getting it wrong. There are lots of problems where you care desperately about getting it wrong, but there's a fair range of problems where you don't care about getting it wrong. As long as you get it right most of the time, it's much better than what you did before. And um, those can be data driven, they can be learned by data, and I think. They were all learned and will be learned. I think it's a huge phase transition. However, it's not perfect or anything else, right? Thank you very much. Josef, what's, what's your opinion on this? I also believe it's a phase transition. I can make another aspect or add another aspect. So we all grew up uh, when we heard about models in science or technology with the method or with the with the meta method of Occam's razor. Occam's razor means you have a model depending on n parameters producing a certain prediction result, a certain quality, and you have a model depending on n minus one parameters. Then you choose the one with the lower amount of parameters in order to deal with. 
And in the moment, we do precisely the opposite. We use models which have hundreds of thousands of parameters where we do not care how many we have. We rather use them to store experiences, which are big data, and uh, work then with them. So it is a, the notion of a parameterized model has radically changed. And Occam's razor, which tells that the number of parameters should be as low as possible in order to guarantee a certain interpretability, this has changed as so radically. So I consider that as a real uh, paradigm change in how we model scientifically and uh, in technology. And it's also uh, another thing which is very clear when you look at signature-based methods, it's a somehow a return of regression methods. So you have certain technology producing features where you can prove that the features are a good basis, and then regressions allow you to, uh, to, uh, to construct the model, which you then use. It's also something which, when you look at stochastic differential equations, depending on a couple of parameters, it's a really different approach to how to, to, to attack problems. So this is one aspect which I can add to what Terry said. And I believe we are now, like in the 20s of the last century, in a period where a lot of experiments, a lot of ideas are floating around, like in the 20s it was with quantum mechanics, and the mathematics will follow up. There are a lot of interesting mathematical problems, problems of a completely different type, which we have never seen before. The question, how does a model behave where you have a cloud of parameters, where the cloud consists of 600,000 uh, real numbers? How does such a model behave? And what does it mean? What does a parameter mean there? This is, these are questions we have never asked, and it's very, very fascinating, I find. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, uh, Yosha, what is your perspective? I don't have much uh, intelligent comments to add, but uh, what I think is that uh, going from here, we will see constant progress. So we will have self-driving cars very soon. We will have uh, everything we dream of. But uh, so what is, I think, what we will be judged by, because this was your, or how this decade will be judged. Yeah, This was your question. I think is how we, how we deal with this new technology. So this is a topic that I just was recently made aware of, and I don't have the answers to this, but I think everything that we dream of, this will happen. So uh, all the classifications we want to do, we will be able to do one way or another. And the question is, do we want to do them? Uh, or who should be able to do that? And so this is, I think, uh, what's on my mind at the moment, but I have no answers to that, yeah. Thank you very much. So, Sheen, we're hearing universal optimism from the mathematicians. Are you going to provide some, some, are you going to provide some sober pessimism? Is it down to the engineers to, to do this? Or, uh, or do you agree? I, I think engineers is way more excited or optimism than oh. mathematicians. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, um, from the industry perspective, uh, when I graduated, my major is um, pattern recognition. It's very difficult to find a job. Um, not only computer vision or whatever, but right now my students are the hottest. They're just, um, before they graduated, one year before they, they get a job, they got plenty of offers. So I think that's kind of the world is changing. And they, um, for the next 20 or 50 years, I think um, we are actually uh, witness the data changing and also software changing and also the hardware changing. I think every part all together will change our way of doing research and study this world. So not only the data science, not only the algorithm, but also hardware and how this society is running all together will change how. But ultimately, I'm optimism. I think we will have the uh, self-driving car one day <laughs> very soon. I won't ask you how soon. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're a usually professional the, compare. Usually the engineers are the optimistic ones and we are the pessimists. <laughs> I know. Nature is inverting itself. Uh, Harold, did, did you want to uh, follow up? 
on another question? Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe the last question uh, of this roundtable discussion is, would you like to, uh, to share how to conduct uh, the successful broadcasting and machine learning research? I did not understand the question. Sorry. I mean, would you like to share your uh, your advice with uh, the audience about uh, how to conduct a uh, successful broadcast and machine learning research? Uh, that's uh, that's the most difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me just complement one statement, which uh, to what uh, was this the question before. I did not choose the example uh, from the 20s of the last century by chance. So when there was actually a lot of optimism how to understand uh, the word of atoms, the quantum word, it was also the period of uh, Kurt Gödel, who was proving no-go theorems. And I think also in, uh, in machine learning, um, I think there will also be some no-go theorems where we see limits and the limits will not only be coming from computational um, uh, limits, but there might also be um, that certain methods in certain areas will not work. So mm. in that sense, uh, I'm very curious to see those theorems and it is, will be interesting to, to analyze this. And on the other hand, I believe there will be a lot of mathematical analysis to prove uh, statements. Now concerning the, the question which you have been asking how, I mean, um, I recommend to all of my students to learn mathematics properly. In particular, if you do stochastic analysis, not to forget about learning algebra. I think Yosha is happy with that statement. It's important uh, to understand the algebraic structure of everything you're working with and you have a great deal of uh, easing your work if you have an algebraic mind which helps you to, to understand this structure. So algebra analysis, uh, probability theory is the is the is always the, the, the uh, background of a mathematician and I think this is very important and one should learn it as detailed as possible. And when it comes to machine learning, um, you can use those mathematical techniques, but you this is what I recommend to my students. You should immediately start programming. It's important to program yourself. Open Python, Keras, and start to train your first network. Look what happens if you uh, change some parameters. It's a source of insight which helps you a lot understanding what is going on. And I think this is one of the beauties of our time, this is the accessibility of technology. We are living in a period where you have the, the best technology available after a couple of mouse clicks open source on your computer. This is wonderful and we should all profit from it. So I think it is extremely important, additionally now for a mathematician, also to, to code. It's the fourth layer of uh, understanding. We all grew up with having an idea, talking about the idea, writing it down, and then teaching the idea. So then have, you have completely understood it. But number four is now also coding up the idea or the algorithms which come out. You learn a lot about that. Yeah. So this is my message which I give to my students. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, Terry, would you like to share your thoughts with us? I think they're very similar to Joseph's, actually. <laughs> uh, that uh, to be intellectually honest and clear, and very much to have a foundation. I think different people have their foundation in different places, but you need a proper rigorous foundation in the direction you come. I personally think mathematicians need or can benefit from being able to computer program, actually. Computers should be something they should be able to use to visualize, to create examples and so on. And it's surprising the number whose skills are not really great, but it's a minor thing in a way. I think the crucial thing is to actually make certain you really understand things from a certain perspective. The Yosef's point about earlier about being counterexamples being important and what you can't do is important. I think it's a really good point. And actually the, 
data science literature is really not very well geared up to that. I can't imagine which three cases of data you're going to use to show it didn't work. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's quite interesting that I think that area is not progressing. Well, it doesn't seem to have space, but maybe I'm wrong to interrogate an idea and develop an idea to make it a better idea. It's a very much a mathematical approach to problems. So I think that's the other point I would push. Don't be driven by the markets. It's a hard thing to say because actually your job sort of depends on the markets to an extent. But somehow we've got to be wanting to understand, to think it through to build the proper thing and it's not always going to be the you don't always get that information out of the best the fastest the state of the art you get it by well chosen questions a bit like uh cindy's example actually it was a very well posed que posed question you'll think to understand how the different bits plugged in into that spot um and it wouldn't necessarily have been catastrophic to find out that in a particular context, it didn't do well. And then you could go away and understand why it doesn't do well. This interrogation to find out about things seems to me incredibly important. And it's not all, you shouldn't do downhill search all the time. I mean, one of the bad things about machine learning is that it's somehow telling you that downhill search works far too often. Because uh, many real world problems do much, much better if you browse around and you find out everything and then you realize the way to get out of the hole. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for uh, your sharing. Uh, Joshua, would you like to um, give us your opinion on that? Yes, thank you. Um, I also want to say about no go theorems. <clears throat> Sorry, this is something I love, and they're great. But uh, and Minsky in the 80s wrote a beautiful book just on no-go theorems on on perceptrons. And um, I have the feeling that in the machine learning um, community, this book is not so well perceived. They 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 blame uh, machine learning cold winter. I was called cold winter on this book. Yeah. So somehow this matches what Terry just said. Yeah. So no-go theorems are fantastic, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I also want to mirror what Terry um, uh, said here, that as a mathematician, we have the luxury really to turn down the laptop and think about the problem until we understand it. And this is really a luxury and it's fun. And uh, yeah, I, I, I highly recommend it. And this frees you. I think Terry says it's, it's hard to not follow the bus and the hype but it's also quite freeing not to do that. So this is a luxury that we as mathematicians have. Um, and yeah, I recommend to use them. And But I agree with um, um, Josef as well. Programming is fun. And um, I only trust my algebraic statements after I've implemented them. So yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Joshua. King, would you like to uh, give, you, give us your advice? Okay, um, actually, uh, I totally agree with all of you. And uh, for my student, uh, the first thing I asked them to do is to go back to learn their algebra. <laughs> so, yeah, because um, right now, people, uh, it's easy to build out a program and you, they can get open source, they can get data, they just plug in and run. So they think their job is to do the parameter tuning. And I told them that's not the real research. If you want to do the real research about machine learning and do something really influential, you need to go back starting from algebra <laughs> the, and the statistical probability. That's very important. That helps you to understand the fundamental. And you can think more than just parameter tuning. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important thing. Well, programming is important, but that's something they need to learn. They must to learn. But uh, from the uh, advisor or guidance perspective, I think the math is some part. Of, I, I personally, I will push them to learn math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Could I just cut in very quickly about these blocking theorems, though? Because it occurred to me that actually rough path theory was essentially finding a way around a blocking theorem. The word for Shelley is 
Shelley, a bitular theorem was exactly this theorem that said Eto calculus was finished. There was nothing you could go further. And actually, it was breaking that barrier that caused rough path theory to happen. So I think one important thing about these theorems that we were just talking about, these blocking theorems, is that you shouldn't regard them as blocking theorems. You should regard them as telling you where the brick walls are. Right, completely right. right. Which uh, then enables you to find your way round the brick walls. And this is also the book Yosha mentioned before by Minsky. Um, they had a different view on artificial intelligence. They were considering artificial intelligence like a, like a language, uh, like a formal language where you have your axioms and then you can form your statements with a certain syntactic approach. And this approach, of course, runs into undecidability questions. You just need to reread Gödel's theorem and you know what you will not be able to talk about uh, easily. Uh, but today's approach is different when there are when you have language recognition or speaking, it is uh, somehow a dynamic view on this system of axioms and also on the language which is used. And nobody wants to frame that into a list of axioms, a finite list of axioms and a finite list of syntactic rules. And that's really also a paradigm change that the no-go theorem, which is proposed by Gödel, is somehow, of course, depends on the fact that you have a language you're talking about, a formal language. And if this, if you, if you, if you go beyond this approach, then you can enter completely different areas of artificial intelligence. And this is what happens today also. So this might be a reason why the machine learning community does not always look at these uh, books uh, where undecidability is classically discussed. But maybe it's my, my personal view, maybe I'm wrong there. Yes, thanks, uh, Joseph and Terry, <laughs> for sharing the view. Uh, Tom, would you like to select one question from the audience? Questions? Do we have Do we have time? I noticed that we've run over the time that we budgeted. Uh, uh, I, I'm just looking at a few questions there. There are some comments on the mathematical limits to machine learning. Somebody pointing out that such th some theorems do exist. I suppose that that uh, echoes the uh, Josh's comment about the book. Yeah. Um, there is a there's a question there from Alexander, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is addresses this question that uh, Josef raised, um, or the point that Josef raised. Would you say that once we mathematically understand neural networks, for example, we will go back to Occam's razor, overparameterizing seems seems to still be due to fueling the learning dynamics and or uh, our lack of understanding of the models. I don't agree. True, true capability. Uh, so I wouldn't. I don't believe that we will return. I mean, if you look at the human brain, this is vastly overparameterized. The, the wording overparameterizing is actually, uh, in many areas of science, this was uh, a bad statement. Now it turns out to be a, a, a via regia, a, a way how you get certain things going. It is not bad anymore. So I don't believe that we will return. We enter a new era of modeling yeah i agree with that i think that it's a mis the parameter low parameterization generates local minima in a sense i mean a very good simple example of this is a particles approximation to a measure you can have a thousand particles which approximate a measure it really doesn't matter which thousand exactly which locations you take it is a grossly overparameterized problem, but it's hugely better way of describing that measure than using wavelets or function basis that doesn't depend on the measure. So I think there are, what we've done actually is move beyond that. And we now understand there are lots of situations where it's actually the wrong thing to do. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'm uh, conscious that time is, is uh, pressing upon us. And I noticed that one of our younger participants in China is approaching her bedtime now. Um, so, and Yosha wants to prepare for his talk. So I think we will, we will thank our panelists there for a very interesting discussion, which could easily have um, continued further, I think, into lots of different areas. Um, we will thank our panelists.
and uh, pause there for a break and resume in about 15 minutes time, I think, for Yosha's talk. How did you want to add anything further or is that? I think it's fine. I don't have anything else to add. OK, so thank you again to our four panelists. And speakers. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. Hello, uh, so I guess we'll uh, be starting again in a couple of minutes. Uh, maybe we can switch to Yosha slides. I see things happening there. Then. Yeah, just let me know when I should start. Okay, uh, they're not full screen right now. Just no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go. You will do it. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so you wanted to see everything on the. I wanted to see you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We we'll just wait until it's twenty, in case people are having their coffee.
Okay. Do you want to share the slides in full screen? Okay, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Let's get started then with the afternoon. So I hope everyone had a nice break um, and feels a bit refreshed for this afternoon session where we have two more speakers. Well, you don't need any introduction, I think. Um, but our first speaker is Josha Deal from the University of Greifswald. Um, there are two uh, titles for this talk. Huh? One of them uh, looks more friendly than the other. What plays the role of CNNs for sequential data or tropical quasi-symmetric functions in time series analysis? I suppose one is the answer to the other. So um, thank you, Josha. Thank you. Um, I have 30 minutes, right? That's yes. the idea. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, the old title that is in the program is a bit unwieldy, I recognized, and so I changed it last time because the talk hopefully is not unwieldy. If you have any questions, uh, maybe in the chat and um, you can interrupt me um, or uh, you unmute yourself and ask me. So I don't need to go through all my slides. If you have questions, yeah, please interrupt me and you would like to take them as they come in yeah if they are yeah. okay i will i will um, say something if i see one thank you and then if you want to look at the slides they are on my web page here um this is joint work with uh, kurush ibrahim ifad and nicolas tapia i think both of them are in the chat and uh, maybe if they're quick enough they can also answer some of the questions if they pop up um okay so we will arrive at an object in the realm of iterated integrals, very uh, broadly speaking, but I will motivate it coming from convolutional neural networks. And um, then as, as we come to the, the object, I will put it more into context of, of what we know and uh, on what um, prior work we are basing uh, standing here. Okay, so convolutional neural networks, I hope everyone in the audience knows I think everyone knows what they are. So you have um, you have some input. It's an image, let's say. Do you see my cursor? Do you see this circular movement of my cursor? Yes, just about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, <clears throat> you have some usually some image data. That's where it first appeared, and you um, apply a kernel to it, and then you get a new output. Um, and um, and then you go on. Uh, most of the time, you still uh, apply a nonlinear ReLU function or something here. And but the the general pattern is like this. Um, so it's uh, um, we had in the second talk we already saw the concept of fully connected networks, right? This is not fully connected. So th this is the weight matrix here that I convolve it. It's used again and again and again for every of these patches that I roll over here. And this is called weight sharing. So this is good because it reduces the number of um, parameters, which allows us to go deeper in the architecture. So this is one of the reasons why probably these CNNs, they work so well. And another <clears throat> um, fact why they probably work so well is that the structure of what I've shown here with the matrices um, it's quite compatible with image data. Yeah? So it's this concept of the receptive field and uh, approximate translation invariance is also something that is inherent to image data. So uh, let me do it very um, superficial. If a, you want to recognize a dog, it doesn't matter whether it's in the top left corner or in the bottom right corner. Yeah? It's always a dog. Yeah? And so if I have here my kernel, which detects a dog, it's fine if I reuse the whole kernel and go through because it will detect the dog wherever it is. Yeah, so these are uh, the two reasons that I understand why CNNs work so well. If you have other reasons, uh, I'm, I would be happy to know them because I'm not an expert in CNNs. Yeah. Okay, but starting from that, I mean, people have, of course, CNNs because they are uh, enormously successful. Uh, they have applied them to all kinds of data, not just image data, and sequential data is one of them. You can just uh, uh, apply them directly. Sorry, the IK and IK shouldn't be here. They only confuse you. Uh, forget about that. What is important here is the, the image here. You can think of a sequential, uh, of a time series as a one-dimensional image, yeah? So this is our, my one-dimensional image. 
I apply a one-dimensional kernel and I get uh, a convolution. And does this make sense? Does it make sense to apply CNNs to sequential data? Well, weight sharing is still happening, so we get that. That's good, yeah. And but the, the second point is not so clear. Yeah, is the structure of this operation compatible with time series data? Um, for images, it was the dog. It doesn't matter where it is, but here for time series, it's not clear. So let's go over some example or one concrete example. And let's try to answer the following question with a CNN. Did a person visit Rome directly before they visited London? So think about the height of the Corona crisis. So uh, Italy was quite uh, badly hit. So you might be interested uh, in, uh, in London, whether that person was in Rome before visiting you. Okay, so let's try to detect that with the CNN. We take a, a size two kernel here, we take stride one, and then we just go over the kernel with, this is an example of a travel route of, of one person. So here, Hamburg, Berlin, this is convolution uh, zero. Um, uh, now I see I should have, uh, uh, what did I, no, it's fine, yeah, sorry. Um, this is convolution zero, and then here's uh, it's, it's one or two, however you want to call, um, count it. We will see the mathematical definition on the next slide, but I hope it's clear that if I replace all these here by numbers, these city names, and then do a proper cal calculation with convolution, then this is spit out. And then I have here my terminal readout. So this is the reduced time series after applying the kernel. The next two would be zero because this pattern does not appear. And then I could just do a max pool, actually uh, not, a, not even pooling, just a global max here. And this would tell me if the max is one, I was in Lon Rome and then I was in London. And if this is zero, then this did not happen and I'm safe. So maybe if there's question already here, then I, I should answer them already here. Otherwise, so far in the chat. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so that's good, but um, that's not actually what we're interested in. Really, what we're interested in is if the person visits Rome sometime before visiting London. Yeah, not immediately before London, but sometime before. So then they could be infected. So uh, we might want. Uh, that not to happen, so to detect that. So a one layer CNN has difficulties detecting this because you would have, unless you make the kernel very large, then of course you can detect it. But for a um, modest sized kernel, there's, you cannot squeeze this nicely into a CNN. Um, and this is what we propose now, now to, um, to uh, propose a new architecture, if you will, for sequential data, or first define what we mean by chronological information. So what, what is chronological inherent to sequences uh, information? And we believe that these kinds of questions are chronological, of chronological type, yeah? I visited Rome, then something happened, I don't care, and then I visited London. So here's how you could de detect this. Uh, so this is a chronological question. I, I write it again. Here's what I could do. I could just still take my kernel here, Rome, London, but I have to now apply a different rule. Before we did stride one, just shift the um, the kernel to the right, the convolution to the right, and then we always get um, these numbers. But this only detects if I'm in London right after Rome. Now let's do. The following, we take all two uh, subsets of size two. So uh, the first is Hamburg, Rome, convolved with this one is zero. Then um, this one is zero as well. This one is zero as well. And here, yeah, depending, I, I was a bit lax here with the, uh, here I'm still talking about convolution. So here I should have put a one. And then the next one, which is the, the one that we're interested in there, I should have put a two. But uh, up to scaling, I hope you agree that uh, running through all subsets of size two, looking for these two sets, whether they are the combination Rome-London, 
and just writing down all these numbers, I get something like this, maybe with a few one halves in between, but I get a one if and only if there's a visit to Rome and then a visit to London. And then I do a max readout and uh, I know the answer. So this would work. But you might already see a problem with this approach. Um, let's see. Let's first make it mathematically because then uh, it becomes maybe more clearer. So K is this what I think of as a kernel. It's not really a kernel, but it it uh, that's what we think of. Yeah. So it takes two cities as input, and it outputs true if and only if the first city is Rome and the second city is London. So here the wedge. This is mathematical notation. Um, Otherwise, it would not have fit on the slides, all these and and ors I use here. So veg, this is a veg. This is an and. So I visit city A for uh, London, Rome first, and then London, and then London. Sorry, that's what I wanted to say. And then London. Um, so that's a kernel. It, it gives you two cities ordered, city A, city B, and it checks whether the first is Rome, the second is London. And then I have this pool, uh, we call it pool here, yeah, because it's akin to a pooling operation. It just takes a bunch of trues and faults, actually n choose two. Uh, this is how many times I have to check my kernel here. Going back here, I have one, two, three, four, five inputs. So n in is five. And I take all subsets of size two. This is n choose two. So this is what this pooling now takes. It takes all these outputs of these kernels and spits out a new output, and here we take the or. We just or all these. So is the first pair true? Or is the second one true? Or the third one? And so on. And you see now, if I plug here for the Zs, so I see argument for the uh, for the pool. I plug in this kernel here. Then I answer exactly the question I'm interested in. It goes over all i1 smaller i2. Uh, in, in, in my input length here. And it asks at time one, am I in Rome? And at time two, am I in uh, London? And it builds the OR of all these questions. So am I in London at uh, Rome at time two, uh, time one, London time two, or am I in Rome at time one, London time three, or, and so on and so on and so on. So this is the thing that we're interested in, yeah? Um, it's a bit crowded this slide, so again, here, if you have questions, I, I can address them now. <clears throat> I don't see anything in the chat, but I maybe I uh, just to clarify, you yeah. need ordered pairs of. Yeah, oh, I think you yeah, I should have said this. This is here ad hoc uh, and a bit sloppy notation. And if, when I write xi here, I mean the order tuple of these indices. Thank mm. you. Yes, I order them. Yes. So this is a set, and then I order the set, and this ordered set is then a tuple that I can plug into K. K accepts tuples, not sets. You're right, and this is a ad hoc notation here. Thank you, yes. Um, yeah, so I1 is smaller than I2. These are all these added two tuples uh, of the interval. And this is true if and only if the event happened that we were interested in. So does someone see the problem here? So what, I mean, this is all very nice. And then probably if we replace these kernels here by something parametrized, and then probably we can do some learning here. Yeah? So if there's a theta somewhere, uh, we can go ahead and learn stuff. But uh, what's the problem? Well, the entries two is a problem. Okay, so there's nothing learnable here yet. We'll come to this later. But first we have to deal with an uh, ostensibly, what ostensibly is a problem is that n choose two, uh, n choose two, and there was nothing special about the two here, yeah? Maybe I'm interested in three cities visited in order, or 15. And then you see this becomes very quickly untractable because this is, uh, yeah, so you have this uh, binomial term here, which is uh, gigantic for modest, even modest numbers here. Okay, so let's deal with that. And the best way to clarify what's going on is to do three cities. So now let's say, my kernel eats three cities, uh, order tuple, city A, city B, city C, and it asks, is the first city Rome? Is the second city, and is the second city London? 
and is the third city Berlin. And um, if I now want to detect in the travel pattern of some person, this order, this chronology, yeah, I can do the same thing. I do the pooling again. I use the pool from before. I apply my kernel to all ordered three tuples. And this is nothing here but the or. Yeah, here I, I spelled it out explicitly again. And this is uh, this already needs order and three evaluations of K here. And then for four cities and, uh, and to the power four and so on. So this becomes untractable. So there's uh, no chance that one can implement this apparently. But in fact, we can. We can do something better here. So for this, we have to zoom in here. We have to really look at the expression. So here I just spelled out again what, what this thing is. It ors, so this is or, ors all these ends. So uh, ors all these uh, three visits of these uh, three cities. Yeah. Am I in city? Am I in Rome at I1, London I2, Berlin I3? And I or this over all I1, I2, I3. Okay. And now the good thing is so, first of all, a remark here. You see, I did not put any brackets here, right? I mean, I put brackets here for the logical statement, but Here's a binary operator. Vetch is a binary operator. Here, and is also is a binary operator. And I did not put any brackets here. So implicitly, I already used that uh, the Vetch is associative. Uh, that, that's just a side remark. What's more important now here for the calculation is that it distributes. So and distributes over all. So I can pull this out. So I can pull this and here out and just rewrite uh, an outer or and an inner or. Yeah? And here I made it in gray. I don't know how, how visible this is on, the, um, on your screen. So in black, this is a running variable and here it's a fixed variable. So here I let the i3 run as I let the i3 run here, but then I only have two more variables I need to let run and these are these guys here. So in this expression, this i3 is fixed. I, I, hope, this is, um, I hope this is clear. So in some sense, I've done nothing here. And um, OK, so uh, I, have I have not done nothing. It's an equality. It's the beauty of algebra. You have equalities. Um, but let's now call this inner sum here. We call it differently. This is just pool, um, uh, how's it called, dash, um, uh, pool prime here at i3. So i3 is this. I sum up to this. I, I or, sorry, it's not the sum, it's an or. I or up to this I3, and uh, I just define this to be pool prime. So this is this huge bracket here. Sorry, it's a big bracket. And then I still have to end the uh, Berlin at the end, yeah? So what does it, uh, what does it, um, um, how can we read this here now? Essentially, this asks um, at time three, has this person, visited Rome and then London, maybe uh, in the very far distant past. Yeah? It's not necessarily it visited London at I3, uh, I3 minus one. So then if this is happening, then I ask, and is there now a visit to Berlin at I3? And then I all over all possibilities, and then one can quickly convince ourselves this is the original question. I just asked the ordered visit to Rome, London, Berlin. OK, so the, the punchline here is now, when I write it like this, this only needs n evaluations here. I3 goes from 0 to n. And if if I know pool prime, we do pool prime on the next slide, then I only have to do n function evaluations here. OK, so now our goal is to look at pool prime and see that this is cheap. But we can, of course, iterate this procedure. So pool prime was actually the original question we had in the beginning. It asks up to time three, did this person visit Rome and then London at some point after? And uh, we can factor this again. I pull out this guy because it's distributing, distributing over the, uh, the end distributes over the or. And then I have this inner, inner or here, which just asks at some point, did this person visit Rome? I call this pool prime prime. 
And if pool prime prime is cheap, then this expression is cheap because this is linear evaluation in uh, so n evaluations in in this expression. If we know the whole, uh, if we know pool prime prime, and this is uh, linear for the entire calculation of this. This is a huge vector here, yeah. So you think this is indexed by three, and uh, you can calculate the whole vector in one go. Uh, so at, at this at this price. And then the, the final step is to look at this pool prime prime, but there's nothing to be done. This is already linear complexity and um, costs also n evaluations. So what have we achieved? We have n uh, evaluations plus n evaluations plus n evaluations, so three n evaluations. So this is order n. So this is linear cost. So in an ostensibly intractable or at least very expensive um, procedure becomes tractable by just using distributivity, actually. So, so Mario in, in the chat points out that this looks like um, dynamic programming. Um, do you agree with that? So uh, I 100% agree with that. And um, maybe I have time in the end to talk about this. Yes, mm. exactly. It is dynamic programming. And... Um, Okay, uh, maybe just one remark how to think of what, what is going on here. So you you have your person that you are asking whether it visited these three cities. So you, what do you do here? You first put a sticker on their head if they visited Rome. Then they, you put a sticker in their head if they visited Rome and then London. And then finally you put a sticker on their head if they visited Berlin afterwards. So this is what we did here. And this follows from distributivity that this works. And it is a dynamic, program in principle, essentially. And so what have we achieved? We calculated something that is very expensive, um, very cheaply. And the only thing we used is um, two facts here. So the AND distributes over the OR, just like the multiplication in the real numbers distributes over addition. And we also used implicitly in our notation that these um, two operations are associative, so it does not matter how I bracket things. And that's it. That's all we needed here. So I can replace these two operations with anything that satisfies this and immediately get a nice pooling operation and a nice kernel that is calculably, calculable. Uh, you can calculate it in uh, linear time. Okay, and this is uh, what this uh, work is about. And the, the correct setting for this is a commutative semi-ring. Um, so this is maybe the, a scary slide for the non-mathematicians in the crowd. And for the mathematicians, they should be wary if they're not seen semi-rings, because as soon as you put an adjective like semi or quasi or something to a well-known mathematical object, Often it's just a generalization for generalization's sake. I, I want to um, ensure you this is not the case for semi-rings. Yeah? So semi-rings are a very, very fundamental object. And um, yeah, uh, and interesting object. Yeah? Before you go on your... Um, Yours like semi-groups, right? Like semi-groups are very <laughs> relevant and yeah. Absolutely relevant heat equation, semi. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> but the semi somehow uh, you think of something less valuable, but it's it's a fundamental object. Yeah. And let me just uh, tell you the definition. It's very simple. So uh, you can think of it as a ring. So a ring is where you have multiplication and addition, and they distribute. Um, where you do don't assume that you have inverses anymore. Yeah. So you you can add here. So you have a commutative monoid, but you cannot subtract. You can multiply, you have a commutative monoid uh, multiplication, but you cannot take fractions usually. Then you have some te uh, technical assumption that the zero is um, absorbing, like in the real numbers, if you multiply 23 times zero, you get zero. And um, this is the assumption that is here. And then you have this distributivity. And this is the ingredient. Actually, we need less than this, but this is a nice setting to, to do what I did on the previous slides for the cities examples. And examples of semi-rings are abundant. Uh, so there's a plethora of examples. Let me just give you a few. 
maybe some of them are interesting to you. So any commutative ring is trivially a ring. So immediately we can work with addition of the real numbers and multiplication of real numbers. And we will see on the next, uh, in a couple of slides or in two slides, um, what this leads to, of course, to classical iterated sum signatures or iterated integral signatures if you want. So then here's the first um, uh, non-trivial or non semi-ring that is not a ring. It's a Boolean semi-ring. This is the one we used. So the set, so our ground set is just true and false. And and or our operations and the or has a unit which is the uh, false. The and has the unit which is true and they distribute. So this is a semi-ring. Then this is the semi-ring from my title. And um, there's nothing particularly special about this one. It's just that it has a nice name and gigantic literature on it. It's a tropical semi-ring or the min plus semi-ring. There you take the real numbers, you throw in the plus infinity also, and your plus, your addition, so this, this O plus here is the minimum. The multiplication, the O dot here, is uh, the classical plus, and then these are the um, the units there. So this is a very interesting uh, semi-ring uh, and has uh, lots of applications in the algebraic geometry, for example, um, or in uh, control theory, scheduling theory. Um, we'll come back to this in a second. I will skip the rest of the examples. Maybe I'll leave them just on the board for a second. You can you don't have to do it with real numbers. You can do semi rings of sets. Then you have intersection and union as um, multiplication and addition and so on and so on. A um, bunch of examples and there's a huge literature as we learned when we embarked on this project in computer science and automata theory, and um, they use them a lot in in algorithms on graphs. And this answers also partly the question from the audience, and they. They, they realize that they're dynamic programming algorithms. You don't have to do that in uh, with real valued um, uh, weights on graphs. You can have them values in a semi-ring. And this is uh, a connection we haven't yet exploited uh, fully. Um, so we have a semi-ring now, hopefully um, made, made some sense here, my definition. If not, think of it as either a ring or one of these two examples, just a Boolean semi-ring and a false and true like in the beginning or the tropical minimum and addition instead of addition and multiplication. As soon as you give me that, I can write a pool, pooling operation. Now choose K here, any K subsets. And I do this iterated sums. And this is... Uh, the left hand side looks very expensive and choose K, very expensive. That's the definition. But the corollary is you can do it in linear time. So it is of course fantastic news if you if you want to work with that. Let's look now at two examples and then my time is already up. Uh, so one example we all know, uh, maybe not in this formulation, but we all know it's it's the these iterated sums. So let's work over the semi-ring R, which is also a, uh, the ring R, which is also a semi-ring. So classical addition, classical multiplication. And then these expressions, these pooling operations on the previous slide, they're just iterated sums. And uh, I just write them here as iterated sums because it fits better in the framework I describe here, but this is of course very closely related to iterated integrals. And um, this has a very long history. Uh, some, uh, some of it was mentioned today. So Graham was maybe uh, very early on thinking of, of, of neural networks using signatures. And a lot of the participants here have contributed. And um, uh, yeah, I, I and co-authors, we also did some minor contributions there. And um, so the ones in blue here are the ones that somehow naturally for us led to the framework we we're using here yeah so what in this sequence of papers here became so i, I do a quick detour now, now on the special case of the semi-ring being actually the ring of real numbers so what became clear in the sequence of these papers here is that it's actually a good idea to not 
just naively look at the iterated sums or iterated integrals and take a logarithm maybe to get away with the minimal description, but to actually learn the signature type features that you're interested in. Yeah. So paraphrasing, it emerged in these works that you do these iterated sums, but you you learn actually what you extract here on it. So if you think of Z as a multidimensional time series, it's multidimensional, and you take some maybe even nonlinear readout of it at different time points with some F that you can learn. Yeah. So this is somehow what became evident in the last few years that this is a good idea to do that. And the only uh, remark we have now is here that uh, in, in the general framework is that to boil this down to a bare minimum here. There's nothing special about the addition here. There's nothing special about the product here. The only thing we need is distributivity and associativity. And this leads to this, what we propose is a richer set of free features. And in this case here now with learnable, learnable iterated sums, uh, they're of this form. And this is my 30 minutes. And then I, I skipped the, I, I just say one word here. So we were interested, starting out, we were interested how the minimum or maximum of a time series could be encoded in, in a, uh, in, uh, a signature-like object. And this is how we got started with the tropical semi-ring. Uh, this was just a short remark. And you can do this. You can define a signature. And um, I will not give you the details here. Let me just summarize. So expressions of the form where you pull some something that is happening on K subsets. This we think is relevant and this is what we consider to be chronological information of the time series. And this in this generality, it's untractable because this grows uh, very fast here. Semi-rings provide a huge class of examples that are tractable, namely expressions of this form. So the special form for the pool and a special form for the K and they are linear, the linear cost of calculations. And then uh, an algebraic remark, which I could not get into, you can define an iterated sum signature in this setting over semi-ring, and it enjoys a lot of interesting properties. Let me stop here. Let me thank How again for the invitation and the organizers for the organization. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Um, so if anyone has any questions, if you could just drop them in the chat, that would be great. Um, I, I wonder, do we want to come back to this question about the dynamic programming? Um, is there anything you, any comments you have about kind of how that relates? Um, that in um, particular, there was something said in the chat by Marina that I, I'm not quite sure I understood it properly, but there, like in C, there are some kind of, you can use shortcuts to. Yeah, so. Um, it says, can you shortcut to like in C? I'm not sure I understood it right there, sorry. Um, so there is an, um, uh, okay, so to answer this dynamic programming questions, yeah. So there is a, obviously a close relation to that. And um, we, early before the end as in 360 example. We can, um, we can, so what is the setting in usual uh, semi-ring theory or automata theory? You have a graph and the edges are weighted. And then you do a bunch of calculations on that. You you look for shortest paths or all shortest anyway. And so we can shoehorn these iterated sums I have here. We can shoehorn this into a particular graph. And if you do the shortest path calculation in this or the, uh, I forgot which one is, we can shoehorn it in and you get exactly the object. And this is of course uh, solved by dynamic programming in, in graph theory, automata theory. But it's not a nice correspondence. So this is something we want to understand. Yeah, I think that in like in programming, in coding, people use dynamic programming in a more general sense, right? Than than this graph. I I, I, I never understood properly what if there is a difference or if it's really different words for the same thing. Or maybe but, Mario, if you want to elaborate on your question. I mean, uh, well, I th I think it's uh, it's clarified already. I, I think it is uh, dynamic programming is usually using a specific semi ring, um, at least um, the way I I uh, read about it. Um, so it's interesting to um, to have it boiled down for the requirements. Mm. I, I, and I just have a comment that um, the interesting thing about um, the, these um, functions are 
that um, it has become easy easy to differentiate them automatically. So if uh, the number of cities you have on your sequence is fixed, like three or, or anything, 15 or so, then um, uh, TensorFlow or, or, or uh, tools like, or toolboxes like these can already do, uh, can differentiate uh, with respect to the parameters. Uh, so it's it's I think it's relatively easy, easily accessible to to be tried out um, for machine learning. You, you mean uh, a dynamic print programming principle is already differentiable? Yes. So uh, oh. in, in another context, the, the output of the dynamic programming, if uh -huh. you want to differentiate the output with respect to the parameters, that's already done uh, automatically. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as long as it's a fixed number of steps, and this is the case, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe a last question from Joseph. If, do you want to unmute yourself, Joseph? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry that I'm too lazy to write it down. <laughs> it's a very similar question to what I asked before to Terry. Um, it's uh, very, very interesting and fascinating generalization, but it depends that you have a total order on time. Um, uh, no, it, it does not. So this is something we're thinking about right now. So um, an immediate uh, generalization would be to partial orders. Yeah. So for yeah. example, uh, phylogenetic trees is something uh, we're really interested in. Okay. So. Uh, this should work there. And then to your question about images. So um, you can do quasi symmetric fun or yeah, iterated sums for images and they satisfy uh, a certain um, dynamic programming principle as well in the sense that if you have your picture, uh, we haven't written up this yet. This is a project okay. I have with, yeah. but yeah. You, you have a picture and you attach another row of the picture or you attach another column. Yeah. So you introduce a sort of artificial time. Um, well, I, I think at least I have some direction. Yeah. So yes. I have, yeah. yeah. Mm. So I understand. So you consider the picture like a, a scan you do from left to right, and you get yeah. the picture row by row. Yeah. I That's understand. how I think of it. Yeah. Okay. No, this I understand. So this type of ordering one can of course do because this is vector value. What you're doing, but. Not sure if it's the best way, but it's it's the only way I know at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be interesting to have a methodology which is less using the structure of the of the parameter set, so the, such that you can learn the optimal way how to scan through it, and that's not so clear. So it's somehow then a set without order where you try different orders in order to get a, a good way how to parameterize it, but. You see, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting problem. I mean, CNNs, yeah, they they work so well because you essentially put a prior on the information. You 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 assume that little blocks yield good information, and this uses uh, structure. And uh, these iterated sums here, they put a different prior of of different stuff that is um, important. Yeah. yeah, maybe there's a unifying framework. I I don't know. Yeah, but thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, should we call it there? Thank you again, Yosho, for, for that great talk. Um, and I guess we can go straight over to, to Josef, if you're ready. I'm ready, uh, but it is first time uh, that I give a talk with teams. Uh -huh. And it is also first time in the Corona period that I am in Zurich. My talk is in London, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, okay. uh, it's a virtual conference. So uh, who is uh, who is uh, moving my slides? Definitely me. I don't know if you can see it now. Just that I address properly uh, the the person who moves my slides with the first name. What is your first name? Luz Martinez. Luz Martinez. Okay. So then, uh, Luz, uh, thank you for um, moving my slides. I'm very happy to contribute the talk to this uh, fascinating uh, conference. Thanks for inviting me. 
let me also switch on my camera and let me look whether my local technology works. Yes, it seems to. You see that I have a little blackboard here because I cannot share my screen and I want at least uh, to do one a little drawing. So, um, yes, would you like if people have questions? Would you like I them to put the drop it in and your monitor or if I call out? Similar to Yosha, just yeah. interrupt me, switch on your microphone and ask uh, directly or write it into the chat. I can see the chat uh, right next to my talk okay. and then I can answer directly. That's the simplest way. I appreciate it like that. It makes the whole uh, talk more lively and I do not feel so lonely in my kitchen. <laughs> So please, let's go to the next slide. The title of the talk is Randomized Signature and Reservoir Computing, and it is contributing to, the, to today's um, uh, afternoon uh, an aspect of uh, signature as a feature extractor, as a universal feature extractor for curves an aspect which is sometimes um, not emphasized, namely signature is also a dynamical system, as uh, Terry pointed out and as, as Yosha pointed out, and uh, Sheen, it is known, but it is this aspect, I want to work a little bit uh, on that and uh, connect this aspect with another paradigm of machine learning, which is actually a little bit older than the machine learning technology, which we know nowadays, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks. This is the paradigm, which is called reservoir computing. I want to make a connection between signature and reservoir computing, and then um, mention that actually this view, this perspective of signature in comparison to reservoir computing lacks one aspect and I want to think whether one can add this aspect and it is uh, it is an interesting um, uh, new um, feature. And there is a conceptual um, contribution which you can take away from this talk and it might also be a computational contribution. So it is a way how to get an object which is almost as good as signature but considerably lower dimensional. Of course it's easy to be lower dimensional than signature because it's an infinite dimensional object but I want to point out that it is almost as efficient as signature. And I will do that with random projection techniques, which are very well known from the theory of compressed sensing, you will see. And then it constructs a true reservoir in the sense of uh, reservoir computing. Next slide, please. And by that, I want also to relate to the panel discussion where we talked about non-interpretability of parameters and uh, you will see reservoir computing takes an extremely um, an extreme point of view in that respect. Most of the parameters are chosen randomly and not trained at all. Only some parameters are trained and still it provides a very efficient way how to do training. We know that all also from classically training procedures that at least the starting points for stochastic gradient descents are randomly chosen and when you look at the evolution of those points uh, under the training procedure, uh, you will end up with uh, points which also have a lot of randomness in the behavior. And uh, just to mention my co-authors here, uh, this is not work by myself, this is work by uh, people in my working group and also in Vienna, Krista Cucchiero is contributing a lot. We have been working since three years on several aspects of the theory. Lukas Gonon, a former PhD student who is now in Munich. Lyudmila Grigorieva, she is in Constance at the University of Constance, an econometrician. Martin Larsson, who is now at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and Juan Pablo Ortega, who is in St. Gallen at the business school, actually. Next slide, please. So, in order for all of us to feel uh, comfortable, I just introduce quickly uh, the main notation. 
Uh, we all have a background in the beautiful theory of rough paths. So a controlled ordinary differential equation is a very well-known object for us. Vector fields are denoted by VI here. So imagine the state space E, capital E, the points in the state space are denoted by Y, the vector fields are denoted by VI, so the map from a point to a tangent object of the uh, state space, and the control is denoted by U. So in rough path theory, this will be the rough path. You can imagine here a Stratonovich Brownian motion, a rough path, a finite variation path, continuous usually because I will use a first order differential calculus uh, or just a continuous, uh, just a smooth curve. And for the ease of uh, uh, following my talk, just imagine a smooth curve. And we have been starting to use controlled ordinary differential equations as sort of models for, for neural networks. So we look there at the flow map, the map from the input, the starting value y to yt, the solution at time t. And when you choose the, the control u appropriately, you can reproduce uh, infinitely deep feedforward networks when the VIs, let's say, are shallow neural networks. So this is already an interesting model in order to analyze certain geometric properties of, uh, of uh, neural networks, and uh, we have a recent work in a SIAM journal for machine learning with Krista and Martin, which is exploiting this point of view. But here I take a different point of view. I consider not the map from the starting point to the, to the point at time t, I consider the map from the control u to the point y t, or to the whole curve from zero to t. Uh, maybe we can go to the next uh, slide. So I will be interested in, for a fixed initial value, the map which takes uh, u, maps it to the solution of the equation. I call this evolution, even though I did not specify the time dependence of the vector fields, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I start at time s, I go to time t, at time s I have the initial value y, and then I evaluate the time t, and the w is a map which goes from our state space, let's say, to a vector space. And um, you can take this as a sort of continuous time model of a recurrent neural network or of an LSTM, if you have appropriate limits of those structures. And when you look about from that point of view, uh, on LSTMs or recurrent neural networks and the training, you would say you train the vector fields and the W. W is very often called the readout, and the vector fields are then the, 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 the recurrent cell of this, uh, of this uh, recurrent network, so these are the local characteristics. And this is very often used, we all know that, for time series uh, analysis, so predictions and calculation of conditional laws and so, uh, filtering and such, uh, such types of problems. Uh, next slide, please. And now I want to introduce the, 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 the paradigm of reservoir computing. What is the point of view of reservoir computing in this uh, setting? Imagine you have such a map from a control U, or from an input u, the input is now the control, uh, to an output. The output might be in some vector space. And instead of doing what the classical recurrent neural network technology or LSTM technology for machine learning suggests, you do the following thing. This is reservoir computing. You split this input-output map into a part which is not trained, a recurrent neural network which is untrained, this is called the reservoir, and into a readout map which is uh, trained. And very often this readout map is also linear. So this is a map from the input to very often a high dimensional vector space. In machine learning you would say this is a feature extraction but done by a recurrent network. But you do not train this recurrent network, you leave it fixed. And the only thing you train is the readout map. And as I write in the, in the paragraph below, often the readout is chosen linear and the reservoir has random features. 
And just for, to make you feel comfortable with this setting, I show you that actually what has been done since many years in the School of Rough Paths and also which forms uh, the core part of uh, applications of rough path theory to machine learning, that this can be seen from that point of view. Next slide, please. Um, before I enter uh, this uh, formal comparison with rough path theory, I want to tell you something which makes reservoir computing fascinating. So originally reservoir computing was uh, invented in a period, it was in the early 2000s, where uh, the computational power was lower than today and therefore training a very complicated recurrent neural network was beyond the scope. And what people did was taking um, uh, input time series, taking a random um, dynamical system on the input time series, which produces a high dimensional intermediate output and then making a regression on this intermediate output. And in order to even accelerate this procedure and providing something which from today's point of view looks a little bit funny, they were not only doing this calculation on a von Neumann type computer, they did it by an experiment. And uh, this was is, a, is an area where people use very often optical experiments. So you have to imagine it like that. You have uh, a time series as an input. This is the control. You modulate the time series on a laser. You send the laser through a, an experiment which has random characteristics. So there are some mirrors and certain fractions and so on, such that at the end you have a certain distribution of intensities and phases. And uh, these guys you measure and then you make a regression on that. And uh, of course, these are incredibly fast and interesting ways how to get a nonlinear feature extraction. And uh, this has been investigated in many respects. One reason why to investigate that is to get low energy uh, driven computers, because of course, von Neumann type computer technology needs energy and actually needs a lot of energy. And such optical computers need, I just say a number, need about one per mil of the energy those uh, von Neumann type computers need. It is still 1000 times more than the brain needs because the brain is the world champion in, uh, in producing very complicated neural networks, uh, which you can run by eating an apple. So this is uh, still an interesting area in this type of uh, machine learning to find low energy um, trainable structures. So low energy training and low energy uh, evaluation. Well, and uh, the idea of reservoir computing is to have this feature extraction, which has some random aspects and to train with a regression on that. And um, what has been observed in the last uh, 20 years since reservoir computing exists is that on the one hand, it does very, very well with generalization tasks. This is a phenomenon we know from uh, rough path theory. And uh, um, it uses, as I said before, only a, a small amount of energy in comparison to von Neumann computers. Next page, please. No, actually already the next slide. So I want to explain now quickly why uh, the, the why signature actually provides us with a reservoir, or let's say almost a reservoir. So everybody knows in the audience when you have a dynamic system where we imagine now that we don't know it. So we have a map, we have some vector fields, but we don't know these vector fields. We only see an instance of a control and we see a, a curve of output. So we see the input and the output and we don't know the, 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 the vector fields. And we would like to learn this, um, this dynamical system such that if we get another input, we can reproduce the correct output. And this is of course a nonlinear complicated map 
a map, as Terry was mentioning in his talk, where there was a no-go theorem. The no-go theorem told this map is in the best case measurable. And it took really uh, uh, a great idea to lift paths to rough paths in order to understand that actually this measurable map has up to this lift Lipschitz properties. And so that you can split off the non uh, Lipschitz property uh, by a universal object. And this is precisely what is done. Next slide, please. So I do not need to repeat that. I just want to introduce notation here. When we have a vector field and imagine now E is a vector space, so the tangent space of E is, uh, is uh, identified with E and we have a function from E to R, which is smooth, then I take this usual notation that V applied to F is nothing else than the direction and derivative of the function in the direction of V. And this is, of course, the well-known transport operator, a first order differential operator on the smooth functions of my state space. Next page, please. And then you can do this, uh, this standard consideration if you have this controlled ordinary differential equation. And if you have a test function, a smooth function on your state space, you can write down an expansion which expands the solution inserted into the test function in the following series. You have on the one hand the iterated integrals and on the other hand you have uh, the vector fields applied uh, k times to the smooth function. So this splits the action of the vector fields, the local characteristics, and the control into two different entities. The iterated integrals only depend on the controls, and the coefficients of the iterated integrals only depend on the local characteristics and on the test function. And this splitting into two can be seen from the point of view of reservoir computing in the following way. Next page, please. So, um, yeah, maybe one page further and then I go back to that. One page further, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> A couple of pages further, I tell you. Um, right. Ne again, one page further, sorry. So, when you want to write the what happens when you insert the solution of the equation into a test function, you can say this is a linear operator, W, which only depends on the vector field. And this operator W is applied to, let's say, a finite number, a finite dimensional vector. These are the iterated integrals up to order M. And you see here precisely the setting of reservoir computing signatures, the reservoir, or let's say truncated signatures, the reservoir, and W is the readout and W is linear. And uh, you have uh, this splitting as we have it in, uh, in reservoir computing. And now I go back to all in order to introduce the correct notation. Uh, just a couple of slides. Tuck. Yes, another one, another one, and another one. Perfect. So signature, as Terry already said, has been introduced by Chen and uh, used in many different areas. Uh, um, I just mentioned Gerard Benarus uh, 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 when talking about hypoelliptricity as one of many, and Terry Lyons at the beginning of the 90s. It's a starting point of rough path analysis, uh, which has been uh, developed, uh, for instance, uh, by Terry and Peter in the last uh, 30 years. Uh, with uh, a lot of success. Next page, please. Let us just introduce a little bit of notation uh, for signatures. So we consider the former series. You see that I love algebra. The former series of uh, uh, non-commutative uh, monomials in D indeterminates. So the D indeterminates are placeholders for vector fields. Vector fields are non-commutative uh, first order differential operators. And if you want to talk about all vector fields, you have no relation at all. And therefore these are, this is really a non-commutative free 
algebra generated by D generators. This is actually a Hopf algebra. On the dual, you have the shuffle product and uh, you can uh, write down a lot of beautiful properties. But the most important thing is that on this algebra, you can write down a dynamical system. And next page, please. This dynamical system is even a linear dynamical system. You just write the vector field, the linear vector field VI, which maps A, an element of the algebra, to A times EI, multiplication from the right. Remember, this is a non-commutative uh, operation, so it matters if it, met, it goes from the left or to the right. Take those linear vector fields, next page please, and look at the equation which I write here in one. So I have the a dynamical system, the derivative with respect to time t of signature is just the vector field, so multiplication from the right times the derivative of the control. And the solution of this dynamical system on the algebra, which can be given a precise sense, is just a series which has as coefficients of the monomial EI1 to EK precisely the iterated integral uh, with, which corresponds to the same order. And you can prove now, this is a very nice exercise in geometry of stochastic differential equation, that actually the signature does not go everywhere in space, it ends up in a subset. The subset is even a group, a Lie group, or at least um, truncations of this subset are a Lie group, a finite dimensional Lie group, and uh, the other one is uh, is, uh, is, a, is a limit of it uh, where you can uh, where you have a certain projective structure on it, and every element, at least of the truncated object, can be reached by a signature if you choose the control appropriately. This is a very nice exercise in Subramanian geometry to prove that. And the interesting and beautiful thing is that the linear maps on this algebra. So the dual, the elements of the dual space restricted to the Lie group actually form an algebra themselves. And this is a uh, main property of being a Hopf algebra. And uh, this is uh, of course uh, then pointing towards the statement that on path space uh, signature produces functioners which are an algebra themselves and therefore dense with respect to certain topologies by stone wire theorem. But that's not uh, important uh, uh, here at this point. I just wanted to mention that the beautiful connections with uh, classical uh, mathematics, which you usually only learn if you once uh, uh, fell over a uh, Bourbaki edition, which has been forgotten for a long time. And uh, of course, this now has a, has a comeback and is very important in understanding uh, these um, structures. And we saw it also in Yosha's talks before, semi groups, monoids, these are all notions coming from Bourbaki and they have a comeback now in such an applied field like uh, machine learning. Next page, please. I showed that already. Signature is a reservoir. We only have to learn W in order to understand the dynamics. So if I give myself a curve of controls U, I calculate signature of U, and I have uh, the solution of, uh, of uh, such a dynamical system Y with unknown vector fields, then I can, by just doing a regression of one curve with respect to the other curves, by just learning W, I can actually get the coefficients, the unknown coefficients, and then if I get a new uh, uh, control, I could just use this regression result in order to calculate uh, the solution of the equation. If I had my computer and if we were not using uh, Teams now, I could show you quickly how beautiful this works. And this is, of course, well known to everybody in rough path analysis. This is the well known split which you have between signature and um, the, the, the W, which depends on the characteristics. Next page, please. So there is a universal reservoir called signature, and uh, any solution of an equation with characteristics VI can be represented that way. 
And maybe you just switch further here and show the whole page. As a next, 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 stop. So this has been used in many uh, works. I just mentioned Pass Prototo, Harald and Terry, who have been uh, working on these areas. But also there's recent work in, uh, which has been done at JP Morgan by Imanol, Terry and Sina, um, where non-parametric pricing and hedging of exotic derivatives uh, um, approaches have been analyzed. Um, this lies in the background, this Hopfalchebraic um, uh, nature of uh, signature, and therefore it gives you a good basis for path functionals. But when you remember, reservoir computing did not only have a reservoir, which is a universal feature extractor, such that you can represent every function of a certain type as a regression on these features, a reservoir computing also came with a random aspect. Whereas signature is a non-random object. And I want to explain in the remaining uh, 10 minutes of my talk why it makes sense to introduce some randomness and what this gives. So actually what I want to do is I want to approximate signature, this infinite dimension, uh, non-random universal object by a lower dimensional object where you lose algebraic properties. So it's not an algebra anymore if you look at the components or not, does not have that, but it is lower dimensional. So which means it is in some respect easier to calculate. Next page, please. So I use here this uh, famous and well-known uh, Johnson Lindenstrauss lemma, which is a lemma from the 80s. At this time it was uh, done uh, not to do compressed sensing, but rather to characterize certain Banach spaces where you have the following property that if you take an endpoint set in the Banach space, you can find a map from the Banach space to R to the power K, such that the endpoint set is again mapped to an endpoint set where uh, the the, the distances are only distorted by epsilon. So in other words, you can write a map on the Spanach space such that the restriction, restriction to Q produces an almost isometric embedding, almost up to epsilon. So this means the distances of the image points are same as uh, almost the same up to epsilon than the original points. And the fascinating thing of this theorem is, of course, that the dimension of the space where you project to depends logarithmically on the number of points. The proof is relatively easy. The imagination or the, the intuition for this uh, theorem is relatively perturbing. So when you think about what it means, it means that in a in a 1000 dimensional space, you have e to the power 1000 almost orthogonal vectors. That's not how you see the world usually. So there is even in a low dimensional space, uh, it is relatively easy to embed a large number of points without destroying the geometry of the point cloud or without completely destroying the geometry of the point cloud. Well, it's a fascinating research, Johnson Lindenstrauss, abstract mathematics uh, from Banach space geometry, which then, of course, founded a lot of uh, um, areas, and one is compressed sensing, where this is used a lot. And what I want to do is actually, or what we are doing here, Krista, Juan Pablo, Ludmila, uh, Lucas and myself is to use this theorem in order to compress signature, but to compress it in a way such that the result is still a dynamical system. Compressing classically is actually not so difficult. Compressing in a way that it is a dynamical system is a little bit more difficult. And I have to say here a caveat, it is still not completely clear to me the full proof. There are some aspects which are still open, but let us continue. Please, next slide. Yeah, so I just need here this, uh, this 
particular norm. It's a sort of L1 type norm, which you associate to this space Q. So you are saying that the norm with respect to this endpoint set Q of, an, of a vector, let's say in our truncated algebra is just the infimum of all of the sum of norms of all coefficients such that this uh, this gives the vector if it is over the empty set it's of course infinity and you have these uh, classic properties next page please and this tells you when you have such a johnson lindenstrauss map to a space rk that actually the the, so the angles are preserved uh, with this type of uh, construction. I don't go into detail of this proposition. This is very well known in this Johnson Strauss business. Next page, please. And then the statement of the theorem which we have is if you are considering signature which runs on a high dimensional space, which is exponential in the number of indeterminates. So if you have, if you truncated order m, you have d to the power m dimensions there. Then we aim to construct a lower dimensional space and the dynamical system on the lower dimensional space. You see how the dynamical system is running. You say, you take z in the lower dimensional space, go with the adjoint of the johnson lindenstrauss map back multiply from the right by EI and then project down again. So this is just uh, mapping the vector fields on the, on the high dimensional space to the low dimensional space with cutting off something. And then you can prove that this dynamical system on the low dimensional space actually has very similar properties to signature. Of course, it is not signature, but it preserves some angles. And from the point of view of a regression, if you think about signature as a regression object, this is, of course, the main thing you need about signature. It is that you have to know that regression is possible. And you are also willing, if regression is possible, to replace signature by something which has similar geometric properties as signature and therefore is still a, a regression basis for certain path space functions. Still, I want you to want to tell you this theorem has to be uh, treated with caution. We are not completely happy with it because the constants are too big, too big for the uh, for what we observe and we still believe that there is some improvement, but it is not clear yet how to do it. Next page, please. Um, yeah, this is the same statement as before. This just tells that up to a linear map, namely the adjoint signature and this dimension, low dimensional dynamical system, actually they are uh, uh, close um, and you can, with a low dimensional system, which I call randomized signature. Next page, please. And the only thing which is interesting here is, um, you remember johnson lindenstrauss said there exists a map F. The fascinating thing about the johnson lindenstrauss lemma is that you can explicitly construct with a probabilistic method, a map with, which satisfies with high probability the johnson lindenstrauss property. It's actually a random matrix. So random matrix choosing appropriately the randomness has the property that it has this johnson lindenstrauss uh, property that it maps if the dimensions are chosen properly, endpoint sets almost isometrically to, uh, to a lower dimensional space. And therefore, if you look at the vector fields which we had before in this setting, it is also a very similar situation. If you have F, F star, F is a random matrix on a high dimensional space and you have F, F star, this is then a random matrix also with a different randomness, but you can calculate that and you can just say that asymptotically, if the dimension is large, but not even, I mean, if the dimensions involved are large, you can say these are asymptotically normally distributed and almost independent entries. So actually, the dynamic system which runs this projection, this random signature, has random matrices as features. 
And then it gets now interesting. So we have a low dimensional projection, which has, or we have a low dimensional solution of a dynamic system with random uh, vector fields. And this has close properties to this infinite dimension object signature. Next, please. Do you, do you think you can start to wrap up, Joseph? Yes, I will. Let the next page, please. So just to uh, write it very concretely, I don't know, uh, I don't want to go into, into uh, 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 detail here. The random signature, when you calculate it concretely, is actually nothing else than take a space of dimension M, take random matrices AI, uh, random shifts beta I, for localization purposes, uh, an activation function sigma, so something which is around zero close to identity and then flattens out. And if you solve this equation and make a regression on the path here, this has very similar properties by what we proved before to a signature. Another minute I need, next page please, just to show you a different point of view on that. If you don't want to use the johnson lindenstrauss approach, but just a more algebraic point of view, you can also construct uh, faithful representations of this algebra A, this Hopf algebra, and one faithful representation is just to take generic vector fields on a manifold, which has to have a certain dimensionality, generic vector fields which do not have uh, relations. One can think a little bit about what that means, but when you look about when you look at the theorem before and when you look at the vector fields where you have random matrices inside, you will see this is actually precisely what the vector fields have as a meaning. And then you can go to the next page, please. So having such vector fields which are generic, so without relations, then you can look at the transport equation uh, which uh, is written with respect to those vector fields. Of course, by the method of characteristics, you can write this equation by uh, composing the initial value with the solution of the flow. And this flow is then taking the role of uh, random signature. And if you want to say, so now this statement just abstractly says that the solution of the transport equation has the same properties as signature. This is just an algebraic fact. And if you want to evaluate it, you have to choose randomly points in your manifold X and randomly functions F, and this approximates then up to arbitrary order of accuracy um, signature. Next page, please. This is just what I tried to say here. And at this point, I would have liked to show you one little uh, example. Next page, please. The example would be learning SMP 500. So what we do here is nothing else than saying, take SMP 500, this is a curve, extract from SMP 500 up to the market price of risk, uh, the market Brownian motion. So it's actually a market Brownian motion with drift. And then you can uh, insert this market Brownian motion into this random reservoir which is in our case usually a 150 dimensional uh, stochastic differential equation driven by this uh, uh, Brownian motion with drift. And then you make your regression of S&P 500 on that. And then you have learned the dynamics through a regression and through this random signature. And uh, this allows you to make then at least pricing statements by continuing the random Brownian motion now without the uh, uh, drift. And even if you have an estimator for the market price of risk, uh, so prediction tasks. So it's in our view the cheapest um, econometric model, which is just based on a regression on this nonlinear random signature object um, for very high dimensional econometric questions. Last page, please. Uh, no, we go to the last page. Ah, yeah, here, very good. Thank you so much. 
So most important is always the work of Terry mentioned here, Pass Pro Toto for many other works. And there are two uh, papers. One is uh, the one which talks about controlled neural ordinary differential equations, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning. And the second one is still under construction, but almost ready, representation of dynamics of randomized signature. Okay, thanks a lot, and uh, I'm looking forward to questions. Great, thank you very much. It's a very nice talk. I think the first time we had a talk where the speaker and the slides are in a different country. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's if anyone would like to ask questions, you can just unmute yourself. I think Josef will be happy with that. Yeah. I would have a question, Josef. Um, so what's the order of the quantity uh, fires in your statement? So you you draw this matrices once and then it's universal for all paths or no this this cannot be right um i draw the random matrix and um this gives me usually vector fields which have the property that many commutators are non-zero this is the important object so when i have a bad draw then i have let's say commutators which are very very small and then i have to do redraw but usually the, the the goal is to get to get through randomness badly commuting vector fields and badly commuting vector fields correspond by the very construction to the to the vector fields which which generate signature these are badly commuting vector fields but if you if you get lucky once, you could store this in your computer and use it forever for all future data. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay. there's nothing special about that. It has nothing to do with the control. It's just okay. a way to generate on a certain space um, non-commuting vector fields. It's just that. Thank you. So this this representation of the signature it, it does depend on the model right it depends on the type of paths that you are that you are expecting is that now correct? this is a first order calculus in that sense it is a geometric rough path and uh, it works for geometric rough path but actually the whole algebra has nothing to do with geometric rough path you can just uh, 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 take another algebraic structure and then you um, you have to do similar construction there. This, the important thing is you have a, a dynamic system which produces the feature extractor signature and then you replace the dynamic system on a usually infinite dimensional space by a lower dimensional replica which as a regression basis works almost as well. Any other questions? I would have another one. So uh, you all already mentioned that the coefficients are not as you would hope. I saw the supremum of the derivative there, right? This is something you would not expect in, in a rough path theory. No, in a rough, it's uh, in a rough path. Of course, you can improve it by using rough path matrix, but ah, the okay. problem is rather. Um, it's not so easy to, to, I mean, it's a sort of non-linear version of Johnson Linton Strauss, and some estimates make me unhappy. They don't work very well. Because the, the problem is actually the norm, this norm with respect to Q, this is an L2, L1 estimate, and they usually provide very large numbers. That's the problem. And it's a functional analytic problem. You, we have to use a little bit the geometry of the of signature in order to get an appropriate estimate there, and this is not so clear. You would say, from a point of view of uh, algebra, it is doing Johnson Linton Strauss on a nilpotent Lie group. It's not so clear how to do that. That's somehow the, the thing. Okay, any last questions? I think we coming to the end. Okay, so if not, then thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, Thanks, a lot. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, um, and 
I, I think that well now now certainly we're at the the end of our of our afternoon. Um, I think it falls to me to to just say some things in closing. So I just want to thank again all of our speakers from from today. Um, the the co-chair of the panel discussion, Tom. Um, I thought this was a really enjoyable panel discussion. By the way, I, I, I had a very nice time listening to this. Um, and I want to personally thank Hal, who was really the driving force of this of this workshop, as you can as you can probably guess. Um, and then finally, from from the point of view of organizing and running things, uh, Paul and Luz from from the RSS and Tricia from DataSig did so much for the advertising, the hosting, the running of the workshop, um, which which I think can agree has gone really smoothly, despite some technical uh, hiccups. Um, and finally, just to all of the all of the participants uh, and all of the audience members. So thank thank you all very much. Um, and then finally. Uh, so, so a few housekeeping things at the end. Um, as far as possible, um, you know, we need the permission of the speakers, of course, but if they are happy with it, we'll put um, slides and recordings on the RSS website for the event and maybe the YouTube channel if, if that works out as well. Um, and if you are interested in the RSS applied probability section, the next meeting will be in November or December. It's not quite decided yet. Um, I think on the topic of random matrices, if I did not uh, write that down wrong. Um, so watch out on the RSS website for that um, and, and you can join the mailing list of your interests as well. Um, how would you like to, to say anything to, to close out? Oh, I think you're muted. I just want to say a thank you for everyone's participation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.